Recording in progress. I'm now going to call the general committee meeting to order for April 10, 2024. This is a 7 p.m. meeting. We're starting 14 minutes uh, after the hour, as we just uh, had uh, some other matters we were dealing with prior to the meeting, as well as uh, another committee prior to this. Uh, before I go into the um, the main agenda, I want to take uh, the opportunity, because you'll see a new face around the table, and welcome Tracy McDonald to the City of Barrie, who joined our Legislative and Court Services team as the Deputy Clerk. As of April the 3rd, 2024, she holds the power. Tracy has a diploma in legal administration from Seneca College. She also holds a certificate in bylaw enforcement from Fleming College and a privacy certificate through McMaster University. She's also a full member of the Association of Municipal Clerks and Treasurers of Ontario. In her previous role as Deputy Clerk in the Town of Orangeville, Tracy managed the day-to-day -day operations of legislative services to council and committees, records management, and FOI. She has also implemented process improvements related to FOI software, digitizing town records, and online business license applications. So on behalf of council, and in fact the whole city, would like to welcome you here tonight, Tracy, and uh, congratulations on joining the team. And we had to leave that out of my notes, so you've got a very caring clerk that managed to sneak that by you. Before uh, we jump into the consent agenda, we'd like to call upon uh, one of our student mayors, Emma Miller from St. Joseph's Catholic High School, who was sworn into office on the 6th of March, 2024, uh, for her three-week term of office. So I'd like to call you right now, Emma, to come up and uh, say your words and let the city know how it went. All right. Hello. Uh, good evening, Mayor Not all, Deputy Mayor Thompson, Council Members, and the General Assembly. Uh, it is my honor to be sitting with you all this evening as my final meeting with this Council commences. Throughout these past few weeks, I have learned such a great deal of insight upon both the municipal government as a whole and as well as the City of Barrie. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I learned how large events are put forth, a lot about zoning, and how much passion is put into something as simple as a street sign. Throughout my time as student mayor, I've recognized the immense character, dedication, and care that each council member holds to their respective position. And I would like to thank you all for demonstrating such qualities that I know this city strives for. Whether it be clarification on what the word chia means, or a small little mint in times of dire boredom, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, you have all shown me the kindness that I know is present within this community. I leave tonight with gratitude, feeling grateful for this position, and I am thankful for your kindness, your patience, and your continued efforts to further better this community. I would lastly like to say that this honor is one that I will be proud to carry, as I was lucky enough to sit with you all on a cold Wednesday night and gain firsthand experience on what makes a strong, dedicated council. Thank you. Amazingly, I haven't fallen between chairs yet, so that's great. And I want to, uh, if it's okay, if you'll let me stay seated instead of standing to, uh, to uh, present this to you. But on behalf of Council, I wanted to present you with a certificate uh, of recognition for your service to the City of Barrie as student mayor and say thank you so much and we wish you nothing but the best in the future. Oh, oh you, can come, well, you can come right in, yeah. Now we've had a lot of uh, we've had a lot of student mayor speeches here. Uh, none quite as honest as that one, uh, and and told the truth about the boring parts of the meeting. But that's okay. Um, we will now move into yeah, Emma. If you'd like to, you're good to go. If you'd like, yeah, we'll just give a second here.
Emma, that exit made it seem so final with a goodbye, not like a see you later or <laughs> I'll watch you guys on TV or anything, you know? Okay, so uh, prior to the uh, presentations, we're going to go through the consent agenda. I'm going to read out each one. Uh, if they are held, uh, then uh, we will deal with them later on this evening. So the first item is uh, reports of reference committees, and that's the Finance and Responsible Governance Committee dated March 20th, 24. Council Harvey, do you have an update that you can provide to Council or to General Committee? Yes, yeah, so uh, committee met, um, and actually uh, on top of the four committee members, we also had uh, five other members of uh, council along with several staff. Um, most of the items were uh, accepted on consent. Uh, the first item was a uh, report from the International Relations Committee, uh, which was from uh, February the 6th of 2024 along with a uh, report of the Investment Board uh, dated uh, February 21st, 2024. Um, there was also a presentation from the Investment Board uh, that had uh, quite a bit of uh, interesting information about uh, the city's finances and the investments that, uh, that they manage for us. I'm just trying to flip screens here so I can get to the, uh, the spicy uh, information. Um, over the past year, the uh, annualized performance of it was at 6.92%, uh, um, which is significant when you look at over the last seven years, it's been just under 3%. Um, of that, it's uh, split into uh, three areas of equity, cash, and also fixed income. Um, one thing that they did highlight is how they uh, exceeded uh, what the... Uh, average rate of return was for the same period. The other things that we spoke about too was uh, an amendment to the International Relations Committee terms of reference, which again was passed on consent, um, which involved things of uh, business networking and also KPIs tied to that uh, committee, along with uh, our business ambassadors, um, along with some education and workforce development. Uh, there was also some correspondence in regards to uh, International Sister Cities Partnership, um, along with uh, a Harrogate uh, Business uh, Improvement uh, Development uh, International Work Exchange Grant System. Um, and then the last thing was the, uh, the presentation that I've already spoken of. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. So the report of the Finance Responsible Governance Committee. Uh, obviously, there was a few motions here, so we're going to go through them one by one. Uh, amendment, the International Relations Committee 2022 to 2026, terms of reference. They're approved. Correspondence, International City, City, Sister Cities Partnership. Approved. Harrogate Business Improvement District International Work Exchange Grant. Approved. The 2023 Investment Management Annual Report. Approved. FRG 5 Memorandum from Circulation List dated February 21st concerning the key performance indicators. Approved. Staff Reports. BFES 001-24 Memorandum of Understanding Provincial Trench Rescue Team. That's approved. Temporary use bylaw to permit agriculture, 15 Harvey Road. Hold, please. Held by Councillor Harvey. DEV 012-24, city-initiated zoning bylaw amendment application, 50 Worsley Street, Ward 2. It's approved. DEV 013-24, City Initiated Bylaw Amendment Application 48 Dean Avenue. Hold, please. That's held by Councilor Morales. DEV 014-24, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw 29 and 35 Sperling Drive, Ward 3. Hold, please. That's held by Councilor Kungel. 
DEV 016-24, pedestrian crossing analysis, Maple View Avenue and Hearst Drive. Hold, Board please. 6 and 10. That's held by Councillor Hamilton. FIN 002-24, 2024 Downtown Barry Business Association Levy. That's approved on consent. FIN 003-24, 2024 tax ratios. That's approved on consent. Request for exemption from signed bylaw 2018-029-201 Fairview Road, Ward 8. It's approved on consent. We'll now go back to uh, presentations prior to dealing with the matters that have been held for debate or discussion later on in the evening. And that presentation tonight is by Stephanie Mack, Associate Director of Waste Management and Environmental Sustainability Department, to provide a presentation concerning the upcoming waste collection changes. Stephanie, the uh, floor is yours. I look forward to all the information. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Nuttall and Council. I'm really excited uh, to be here this evening to talk about waste management. Uh, I have to tell you up front, it is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, for those of you at the town hall uh, this week, you'll know that um, there is nothing more exciting than garbage. And there is nothing more exciting, really, than garbage changes, waste collection changes. And we thought it prudent at this time, as we get ready for the next couple of weeks, we're gearing up for May 1st, to come before you this evening to really give you some key messages to prepare our community for these changes. And uh, I come as the voice, but really the part of a larger team here at the city that is very busy right now getting ready. Uh, solid waste policy and planning, solid waste operations, and a collaboration really with Access Berry Communications and uh, Service Berry. So we're all very busy getting ready for these changes. Uh, before I get into really looking at the future and the new contract, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank our existing contractor, Waste Connections of Canada. Uh, they have serviced, as I understand it, our community for almost 20 years. And uh, I can tell you that collecting uh, waste and garbage collection, it's a hard job. These drivers have been out, uh, you know, collecting, keeping our streets clean uh, every day. And to them, I say thank you. So with that, though, we're going to look forward. We are getting ready to onboard our new contractor, Mterra Environmental. Uh, the team here is actually meeting with them every week right now to ensure that all the pieces are in place for the May 1st start. Uh, pieces like that the trucks are all ready to go. Uh, they are preparing a dedicated fleet of around 16 trucks. They will have some spares to assist, but those trucks are ready to go. We, we can't wait to show them off. Uh, a few surprises there, so we're looking forward to that. Uh, we are also ensuring that their recruitment is going well, that their facility is ready, all the pieces that make a waste contract work. What I think is interesting about waste contracts is Waste Connections will finish on Tuesday evening and Mterra will be ready to travel this city the next day with no interruption in service. So with these slides, we're going to give you a few key messages on what to expect, really the important message that we need to get across. So essentially, the city contract will, uh, with Mterra will in include the collection of garbage, organics, business recycling. We're going to talk a little bit about recycling tonight. Uh, yard waste and in the fall batteries. We'll see different trucks on the road. Uh, drivers. Now this is where it gets a little bit into the important key message of the evening. And uh, I can't say this enough, if uh, those on Monday heard the message really clear, I hope, is that we are going to have a new waste collection schedule. There will be about 10,000 properties impacted by this schedule change. And what we are asking is that everyone check their schedule. I think there is a little bit of a habit to look down the street some days and say, oh, you know, my neighbors put their, put their garbage out, I'm going to put mine out too, and we could miss a whole street. 
So we want to make sure that we're getting the material off the street. We don't have any misses. So if we could just have everyone check their schedule, that would be great. Uh, MTERA has let us know that when they start a new contract, they notice something, and that is a lot of households do not have their material out at 7 a.m. because we get used to what time our truck usually travels the road. So if we could just remind everyone across the city, especially for those first few two weeks of May, to have their materials out at 7 a.m. so they are not missed. New curbside contracts are a great time uh, for changes, for program changes. We're looking to align this contract with provincial changes. We're going to talk about the Blue Box uh, transition, but also to look ahead, to look to the future of this city and how we can collect waste better and how our program can be better. So three program changes I want to highlight this evening, uh, starting with pet waste in the green bin. Uh, to be clear, we've had some questions. I had this uh, question on Monday evening. Dog waste, cat waste, any organic matter that relates to, to pet waste can be put in the green bin. It sounds like a small change, but it's actually going to be impactful at the landfill. I'm so excited about this. We know that our garbage is about eight, our curbside garbage, 18% pet waste. So this could potentially, if everyone does the right thing and puts it in the green bin, we could save 3,600 tons at the landfill every year. And uh, I can't wait to see the numbers uh, as the new contract starts. Yard waste. There is a change to our yard waste collection. Again, to uh, really look at a different municipal model for collection. Uh, Yard waste is a really challenging material to collect because of the unpredictable nature of what's going to be at the curb. So uh, to give you an example of the difference in tonnage, we know in the summer, the heaviest day in the summer, we might get 25 tons of leaves compared to the fall where a contractor would be expected to take 150 tons of yard waste off the street. So this new model, having material out on Monday across the city, will allow them to allocate resources to be better prepared for the week ahead and to understand the material out there. So this is a bi-weekly consistent schedule, April to November, uh, materials out on Monday to be collected by end of day Friday. And last, and this one, we're getting ready for Victoria Day. There will be no change now to the holiday schedule for waste collection, except for Christmas and New Year's. So again, Victoria Day will be our first test of this. We're going to work with our communications team to get the message out that if you are a Monday collection day, place it out on Victoria Day, and there will be no uh, shift to the schedule. And this will be the same the same message uh, throughout the summer for all of our holidays. So recycling tra uh, changes, I can't believe uh, really to be quite honest that the day has come for us to transition our blue box program. Uh, this is a provincial change under regulation 39121, the blue box regulation. We aren't the first municipality to transition. So this actual transition of municipal blue box programs to the, to the producers, Circular Materials will be their representative. They are the collection system administrator for the, for the province. Uh, so this actually started in July and it's, it's gone really well. That's what we're hearing from other municipalities. Our neighbors in the county of Simcoe transitioned in January. To, to no fan it, it was just it was a seamless transition for residents and so we we are expecting the same we are working hard right now with circular materials to ensure that they understand the city and that their contractor who is actually our contractor we will be sharing mtera under two different contracts they will be managing the residential recycling on behalf of the producers or circular materials uh, here in the city so what to expect, so we've had lots of questions about what this change means at the curb. It is a reminder uh, to residents that really they will see no change. They are to put their blue box, their gray bin out at the curb on their new collection, collection day, again asking that they check their schedule. 
And, uh, and a critical point to this is that customer service inquiries regarding recycling will now be directed to circular materials. And uh, it's not that we don't want to assist and help, but uh, they have been actually very clear to us that they want to handle the questions regarding recycling or their contractor will answer them on behalf of their organization. Changes for businesses. Uh, the model, the, how we compensate our contractor is changing to a per unit basis. And really, uh, for us, it is going to be a better form of compensation. It allows us to better understand the city, the units that we service, and to just to have a better understanding of what that looks like for service provision. But the key messages for businesses, and this deadline is coming really quickly, we're going to be working with our communications team to ensure that the message is out as we get closer to April 15th. That is the deadline for businesses to register to ensure uninterrupted service for May 1st. It doesn't mean that businesses can't register after that date. It just means that we are actually passing the information off to MTERA to, for them to establish their routes. Uh, and again, they are creating these routes after April 15th with the businesses that are registered. Uh, following that, our business will need to register by the 15th of the month to ensure service for the next month. This intake will be continual until we uh, put forward the new plan for automated cart collection across the city in September 2025. Downtown uh, Barry BIA will see a change to weekly, or sorry, to daily collection uh, as of May 1st for garbage, business recycling, and residential organics. Uh, residential recycling will be collected by circular materials on Tuesday. So we'll be looking uh, at the BIA how this looks with really the mixed use properties, something that we'll be watching uh, going forward. Uh, we understand we had a great meeting with the downtown uh, BIA board back in February that this is a work in progress for the waste team, but we're, uh, we're pleased to offer that daily collection in the interim as we put together uh, the plan for servicing. And just a note that on May 3rd, Friday, May 3rd, there will be a special waste collection for approximately 7,000 properties in wards 3, 5, 7, 8, and 9. Um, just really to address the service gap moving from the old schedule to the new schedule. They miss a critical uh, garbage or organics collection, and this will just ensure that uh, they, especially for garbage, they're not holding on to materials uh, longer than the biweekly period. So 7,000 or so letters are being sent out to these property owners to let them know that they are on the list for that special collection. And again, we request that they have um, their materials out for 7 a.m. If uh, we're, you know, you're checking your schedule at barry.ca slash curbside collection schedule, it will note that you are on that list for a special collection also. So there's two ways, the letter and then when you're checking the schedule. So I love this slide because it takes all of that information uh, and really synthesizes it that synthesizes it down to six really simple points that uh, everyone you know needs to know to get ready for May 1st is number one again check your collection schedule make sure that the materials are out by 7 a.m. to understand if you are uh, on that special collection for Friday May 3rd again noted on the special collection schedule uh, just double check that a pet waste in your green bin, we're going to try to divert that material. A yard waste to the curb by 7 a.m. on Monday of your collection week. It will be opposite your garbage week. And remember that there are no shifts for the holidays, with the exception of Christmas and New Year's. And getting to the customer service piece, it is something that we're working really hard uh, with uh, Service Barry and with Access Barry and the team there. I uh, just wanted to note the two differences based on material type now. So for questions regarding uh, garbage, organics, business recycling, yard waste, and when we get to the fall batteries, 
Uh, we are asking uh, that residents contact Service Barry, and we're pleased to assist and provide that information. Um, on the screen there, you will see circular materials information for questions regarding residential recycling. Again, uh, they have asked that we provide this information to ensure that the messages that they want to relay to residents um, come through them. And with that, uh, Mayor Nuttall, uh, I am pleased to address any questions regarding the changes. Thank you for the presentation. And members of Council, start with Councillor Kungle, go to Councillor Corser, uh, then Councillor Hamilton, then Councillor Harvey. And that's it, I'm cutting it off there. <laughs> Councillor Kungle. Three, three, Mayor Nettle. Thank you, Ms. Mack. That was uh, fantastic. I do have a, a couple of questions. Maybe to start with where you just left off, um, while um, Circular Materials has identified wanting to be the go-to call for um, recycling, is that active now? So as that community... You know, while we're receiving it here, I know I'll find it at some point in the app, but is there a timeline by which that can start, or is that already go live as a contact option? Uh, through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Kungle. Uh, that information is now live, and their website is live, but uh, really, you know, I will say we are pleased to help in the interim, or, you know, if the if a resident is unsure if their question would be a circular materials question or a city of Barrie question, we're pleased to assist. Thank you. My uh, uh, next question, in addition to saying thank you for being at the town halls, because um, you and the team have made yourselves available to several to date, and that's been of great benefit. So thank you for actually going above and beyond around uh, being accessible around changes. Some of the questions uh, I've been getting more recently are really about the um, what ifs tied to your April to November time frame for organics. And we felt this a little bit when we had delayed service during uh, the pandemic and the ter deterioration of paper bags um, holding the yard waste um, and what that does. So mm -hmm. uh, do we have key messages go ready or is there anything to date? Because I can, I'm already getting but can see people concerned on a rainy week and as we bridge into the different seasons. Um, how viable those bags will be around pickup um, between Monday to Friday if you if you put them out on Monday and they've been there for five days. Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Kungal. Um, leaf and yard waste, we know we've had lots of questions on those changes. And if I could provide uh, some reassurance, uh, this is a municipal model that I have seen work. Um, our neighbors in the county of Simcoe actually have the same uh, collection method for leaf and yard waste. So we're not pioneers of this, um, but at the same time, I do understand the concerns. So if I could uh, really uh, just provide, you know, some assurance that we are going to be, to be watching, right? So our job doesn't end on May 1st. Our job actually begins. So we are going to be monitoring the collection, including leaf and yard waste this spring, but I think more critically will be in the fall, right? So we're going to watch how it goes. We're going to obviously be working with Serviceberry to understand uh, the reaction of the community, what we're hearing. Um, our contractor will pick up bags that are, are maybe a little bit broken. They've committed to helping us with that to ensure that our, our streets stay clean. Um, but if I could actually just ask for, you know, let's get through the spring and the fall. Let's see how it goes. We'll be watching it. And then we're pleased to bring back more, you know, information or report to council on how that goes. Thank you. My next question, um, and it might just get into... Uh, habits that maybe some of us practice that we haven't had a check in on in a while when it comes to what does curbside mean and so you know when we're going out I think to your example of peeking down um, the road at neighbors um, seeing a lot of differences between um, individuals that actually put all of their recycling uh, on the roadway versus on their lawn or up into their driveway and so is there a practice that we need to also communicate or remind about where bins need to be placed so they're actually, especially as we're moving into larger bins in the future, they're not impeding traffic or parking. 
uh, through you, Mayor Nettle. Uh, of course, we don't like to see bins on the road, so, uh, and that will be the same for carts, and we will be providing more information as we roll out, so to speak, the cart program on where to place those carts, how they need to be set up for the automated collection. Um, one thing I have noticed, and we're not, we're hopefully out of the winter season, is to be, uh, to be clear that the bins should not be on snowbanks. So that would be one uh, key message that we could relay. You know, that will come next winter. Um, it actually is a safety uh, issue for drivers if they're having to pull uh, bins or bags from, from snowbanks. Um, but I will take that back, Councillor Kungal, um, ask the collections team, the operations team, if they have any feedback on what they're seeing. Um, but of course, we, need, we don't need them in the way of traffic, the bins or the garbage on the set outs. Thank you. And then I think my last question um, really is, um, and I could be incorrect, but I believe uh, County of Simcoe offers half-sized bins. So one of the core questions I'm getting is uh, with respects to just size, maneuverability, storage space, and if I don't really produce that much waste, um, is there, are there other options? My understanding is different sizes might be available, but do you have to pre-order or opt into that at a particular point in time? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nettle, uh, to Councillor Kungal. Um, we're really uh, looking forward to bringing more messages back on what that cart program will look like, but I can tell you that we have heard loud and clear uh, that the ability to exchange for a smaller size garbage cart, so the 120 liter organics is the smallest that that automated truck can pick up. We were uh, looking at a standard set out of a 240 liter garbage cart and 120 liter organics. And we've actually, in our little, on our tour, uh, we bring the bins now, or the carts, wherever we go. Um, there has been interest in that smaller sized garbage cart, the 120 liter. So uh, we, are, we are working on that to put together an exchange program. That will be a conversation with MTERA, with our contractor, after we get through May. So I've said to, the, to, to my team, I've said, let's get through May. Let's get garbage off the street. Let's get MTERA used to the city. And then we're going to be working really hard on coming forward with the plan for the carts and what that will look like as we work to September 2025. 20, and I actually just wanted to add this because we have heard a little bit of confusion of um, the community concern that they haven't had their carts delivered and the changes coming in May. To be clear, the automated cart collection is the second phase that will come in September 2025. We have this first group of changes that will come in May, and then we're going to put forward that plan for September 2025. That's great. Thank you. And that's all my questions. Thank you. Councillor Forster. Uh, yes, uh, counts uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nuttall. Uh, it seems that, uh, again, Councillor Kungal has stolen a lot of my questions. <laughs> but I do have a lot of pushback uh, and a lot of questions and concerns regarding the yard waste as well. And if we do have a bad week, storm weather, and it is a five-day window of collection, when the, if these bags end up, uh, I've been asked this question multiple times, when these bags deteriorate and end up on the road, who would be responsible for cleaning that up? Would that be the contractor or would that be the resident if they put out their yard waste on a Monday, it storms all week and it doesn't get picked up on Friday? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle. Um, in regard to the change, it, you are going to probably hear me over the next uh, at least few years uh, say change is hard. And we understand that, especially waste changes. So we do understand the concern regarding the yard waste collection. And uh, in regard to, you know, if those bags deteriorate, uh, the contractor will be assisting us to, to clean up, right, to, to clean up. But um, we have noticed something, and that is that yard work most often is done on a weekend, and uh, that material will be set out, you know, likely ahead of the collection day regardless. And... Uh, so I'm not certain it will be as big of a change as, you know, that anxiety or that fear of the waste change is actually, you know, presenting itself. Um, so hopefully that, uh, you know, relays some of the, the, the fear. 
Yeah, change is hard, and I thank you for that, and thank you for the presentation, and I'm, I'm optimistic that we're going to have a really good transition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corser. Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, and through you, my question's the same. I think we're all hearing the same concern with respect to the yard waste. So I liked your answer. I think it's hard for us to complain. Prior to the changes, I'm willing to give it a shot based on what the county has experienced to date. Um, I would just ask, though, is, is there anything in the contract with the contractor that would preclude them from making a change. I understand how the yard waste changes benefits the contractor. I don't know if I really see the benefit to the residents, but again, I'm willing to, to go down this path with you. Um, but I just want to make sure that if come the spring or early fall, all we're hearing is consistent complaints, mm -hmm. that we do have the flexibility with the contractor to, to amend the schedule to something that works better for residents. Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Hamilton. Um, we want this contract to be a success. And I wouldn't want council to feel that, you know, for eight years plus two extensions, we were locked into a bad uh, method to collect leaf and yard waste. And so we will be watching. We'll get through the spring and fall. We'll come back with, uh, with an update to just let you know how it's going, the calls, what we're hearing. We're obviously monitoring uh, you know, social media and things like that to understand, uh, to say that there always is an option uh, to change uh, you know, waste collection methods uh, should it not be working for the city. Thank you. So what I'm hearing, I can take back to residents. If it doesn't work, there's the option, and we will be able to correct things, but let's give it a shot. So thank you for that. Councillor Harvey, then Councillor Morales. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nuttall. Actually, with all the questions that have been asked, the, uh, the question that I was thinking of uh, asking has already been uh, resolved, but uh, I am actually excited to see these new trucks. Uh, as someone that was a garbage collector some 35 years ago for a very short blip in Mississauga, I wish we had those uh, arms at the time because it uh, definitely was not fun li pitching 26 tons of garbage uh, and filling two trucks in a 12-hour shift. So thank you uh, for your presentation. Councilor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Nuttall. Chrysler, garbage man, have you and Michael Keaton ever been in the same room? Uh, 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 I have a question. So, Ms. Mack, thank you, not only for the presentation, but Mayor Nuttall, as you know, uh, Ms. Mack had the horrible job, a lovely job, of uh, taking a two-hour phone call from me in February regarding these changes, and she just powered through it. And, uh, Ms. Mack, um, you, got, you allowed me to get to such a good boilerplate response that I can share with my residents and give Gordon con context to it because the yard question is hard. And I told you, if I don't believe in the answer that I get from staff, not that it's a wrong answer, I, I can't communicate it to my residents. I'd almost rather tell them I don't know or let's wait and find out. But you really helped me get to that point with that. And I actually was uh, trying to find the old answer from February, so thank you for that. I saw something interesting on our social media a couple of weeks ago. So somebody jumped in and said, um, why are we doing this? And the city uh, Facebook page responded appropriately, saying there's going to be some savings. And then the response was, well, if the residents are seeing, if we're going to get savings overall, is that going to be reflected on our tax bill? Obviously not. The, the follow-up response from city staff was, those savings will be used to um, uh, mitigate uh, increases in landfill costs, not just on the commercial and industrial side, which I guess leads to my question. There's going to be a lot of change in behavior, and I don't want to call it sacrifices, but um, rolling up the sleeves from the residential sector. Are we also going to be seeing some more stringent uh, garbage uh, pickup, uh, more discipline from our industrial sec sector as well as our commercial sector? Because I'm not trying to take the side of that social media comment, but it, it, it kind of alluded to, to a good point. If the residential residents uh, are willing to kind of do their fair share to keep costs down, improve efficiency, um, and reduce cost, I'm wondering what, it, what if any, uh, of those same kind of uh, efforts are being made uh, for industrial, commercial, and even BIA pickup efforts. Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nettle, to Councilor Morales. We are just beginning our, our journey, our waste journey, and uh, outlined within the memo, there was a little, there was a paragraph regarding uh, businesses and our service for the ICNI sector. And there's some really interesting conversations um, as the blue box transition, so that's the residential recycling piece, uh, leaving municipalities to make decisions regarding uh, recycling for the ICNI sector. 
And uh, within that memo, within the memo on the circulation list, we did to commit to coming back to council with a report regarding a waste servicing for ICNI properties. And the timing will be as we move to automated collection. Uh, you know, without getting into the details, it has to do with, uh, with limits and how we service those properties will be a conversation that we will need to have on CART provision. And uh, so to answer your question, we need to talk about uh, waste limits for the ICNI sector, what that looks like, what it looks like in the big picture, in how much garbage we actually collect, what we're landfilling, and uh, I think there's a bigger discussion to be had on that. Perfect, and and I appreciate the fact that we're just beginning. Um, at, at at no point at no point is my intent to be punitive towards that the. Uh, the acronym that you said of that sector. It's just one of those. I know that if we were going to talk about taxes, if we were going to, you know, change tax ratios, and if, the, if we were doing increasing residential to subsidize industrial, there, there, there would be obviously a pushback. So uh, we're not doing that. But obviously with garbage, I would also hope that if we're making such drastic changes to residential, that a pro appropriate um, uh, changes uh, and, and mitigation efforts are also made for industrial and commercial. So I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And are we going to be getting a formal presentation? I guess my last question to you, uh, are, are you coming back formally in six months, in a year? Is there a specific um, kind of uh, expected timeline that we can even communicate to our residents like this is just the beginning and we are going to get a formal um, quarterly memo or presentation at specific timelines? Has that been decided yet? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle. Uh, to Councilor Morales. Uh, we are anticipating uh, coming forward likely this fall. It, the timing is really uh, to do with uh, delivery, order and delivery of the carts. So uh, we will get through May and then we know that we will come forward with a bigger discussion on what that looks like, uh, obviously uh, for the decision of Council on delivery and ordering of those carts for the ICNI sector. Perfect, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Thank you, Mayor Nuttle. Um, so that was a great question by Councilor Morales. I was wondering, as you know, we're at a two-bag limit in our residential every second week, and it's all about the sustainability of our landfill. As being the owner of that, it's, you know, the savings are huge, and hopefully that we're able to sustain it a lot longer for them reasons. Um, was there ever, why did we go with the 240 liter? And will they be monitoring the two bag limits still as the operator now never exits the truck? Uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nuttall, to Deputy Mayor Thompson. The uh, two bag limit uh, or is really the cart size is set to take the existing bi weekly garbage limit, uh, setting that 240 liter cart size. But interestingly enough, what we are hearing again, uh, especially at the town halls, when they see the carts, when we bring them out, is residents committing or you know feeling that they can use the 120 liter garbage cart, that that would be enough for them, uh, really lessening their garbage limit. Um, I think it's an interesting conversation. Um, we'd be pleased to, to discuss this further with council if there would be you know, some uh, thought to reducing the garbage limit. Obviously looking uh, to that landfill, to increasing diversion, um, but really the 240 liter garbage cart was set to align with the existing limit. So just to, just to confirm in there, it's, it's not a two bag limit, right? It's a two container limit. So you can have already have more than two bags down at the road. Is it not one container, two bags? It is uh, two standard size garbage bags by weekly bear in the, in the containers or? Uh, they can go in garbage cans in the yeah. standard uh, size garbage cans. I think I pack them really tight, I guess, is what I just learned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I live on Pringle. You can, you can look there for... Um, another question. Was there ever consideration of limiting the yard waste bags? As you mentioned, that is the number one concern. In you know the summer, you're going to get one bag, and probably 90% of all yard waste will be picked up on the Monday. 
because there's, you know, not an accumulation. Um, was there ever a consideration of numbering? And that way the contractor then could gear up to, to do, you know, the Monday, Tuesday regular stops and not having it out on the, for a week? Mm -hmm. Is there any consideration? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to Deputy, Ma Deputy Mayor Thompson. Uh, to my knowledge, that's an interesting thought. I, I, I do not recall any municipality doing that way, doing it that way, uh, for the reason that when residents are out doing yard work, they're not counting the bags, right? Um, you can see anything from a couple to 17, 20 bags uh, in, in areas where, uh, you know, the leaf drop is all at the same time. But um, to my knowledge, there, that isn't a municipal uh, way to collect leaf and yard waste. And my last comment, or question maybe, it's, it's not a comment actually. Um, if, if a resident chose to buy a separate bin to store their yard waste in, Will there be a mechanical pickup available for that? And is that something, like, not at the cost of the municipality, but if a resident chose, let's say, you know, it, it'll hold two bags or mm -hmm. they don't have lots of, but they choose not to have a paper bag at the end, would there be an opportunity where they could put it in and then it would be dumped opposed to the bags? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to, to Deputy Mayor. Um, I would have to take that question back to MTERA and how they have ordered their trucks. They have ordered the existing complement of trucks to, uh, to have a manual collection of leaf and yard waste uh, throughout the term of the contract. Uh, that said, that would be something that I'd be pleased to ask them and follow up with you on. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. And I have uh, Councillor Harris. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nottle. I was just talking for a second. I apologize. I might have missed this question. If it was asked, I apologize. Ms. Mack, thank you for a great presentation. It's kind of along the, th the theme that uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson was going around, the waste collection. Do they, have they considered or will, are they considering like surge um, collection so they know like the primary time of yard pickup is spring and then not again until fall so they would, they know they're going to use more trucks in those times in summer, not so much. Is that part of their, their plan? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Harris, uh, that is a great question. So we will have an existing uh, dedicated complement of split trucks. So that means there will be going to, the week that is the leaf and yard waste, they're going to be collecting organics, uh, food and organic waste in half of the truck. The other half of the truck will be collecting leaf and yard waste. They have additional trucks. They understand the city has had challenges with leaf and yard waste, and they will be putting what we call single stream trucks dedicated to leaf and yard waste to help. And I think uh, what is interesting about that Monday, everyone sets it out. Uh, they can, you know, scout out areas. They'll have their supervisors throughout the city to get an indication of the set outs, helping them to bring in extra resources if they need it on the Monday, giving them the five days to clear. So on Monday, they'll know what they're looking at in, in regard to the set outs. Thank you. Maybe one follow-up, Mernetto. Uh, um, is the expectation that they've got five days, but is the expectation or the hope that it will be done knowing that the efficiencies that are now permitted through knowing, um, you know, having more certainty that uh, you can get as many done in a day as you want, that um, they expect to less days be required overall than, than currently we have? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Harris. Uh, that's a great point. Um, there seems to be some uh, fear that, you know, everyone's leaf and yard waste is going to be sitting out until Friday. They are going to start on Monday, and they're going to want to clear that leaf and yard waste as, as much as they can to get it done and to check it off their list. So they'll start in the Monday collection area, and they'll be working to see, you know, their, their crews and their trucks and their resources to clear the city. Some weeks it might take until Friday, and other weeks they might get ahead of it and uh, clear before Friday. Great. Thank you. Councillor Reba. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I think we're, uh, we're all grateful that we have you on board and somebody as passionate as you about, um, about garbage. Um, my question has to do with apartment buildings. Um, I know in my ward we have 
a couple of apartment buildings that have decided that they don't want to do recycling. Um, is anything changing, as, or tell us what, what the story is around apartment buildings? Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Ritma. Uh, alongside the, the discussion on ICNI, uh, we're going to be pleased to bring forward more information on our multi-residential servicing and the programs for that. So uh, currently we service uh, here at the city approximately 300 multi-residential facilities. Some of them get front-end garbage. Some of them are serviced with carts. It's a, it's a varied program. Uh, for apartment buildings, to answer your question, to apartment buildings, multi-residential, uh, without a recycling programs, there is provincial uh, legislation that actually requires apartment buildings, multi-res, alongside the ICNI sector to divert uh, recycling, blue box recycling. Uh, the good news for those that don't participate is that they are covered under the blue box regulation. So the blue box regulation really isn't just, uh, you know, for municipal serviced properties. There is the intention that come January 1st, 2026, those buildings will be able to apply to RIPRA. So that's the provincial over, overseer of the transition in order to secure servicing from circular materials. Once we know more, that hasn't been set up, the framework on what that looks like. Uh, we'd be pleased to uh, provide that information and really a fulsome update on multi-residential servicing. Uh, something else that is also coming into play for multi-residential uh, buildings is the requirement uh, under the food and organic waste policy in 2025 to have an, a food and organic waste, a green bin program. So that is something we're watching closely. Again, getting through the changes in May to really focus on how can we best support uh, these types of, uh, of units to ensure that we're diverting and we're reducing that garbage. Councillor Nixon. Thank you. <laughs> Through you, Mayor Nuttall. Uh, thank you again, as everyone has said, and, and uh, thank you once again for, for attending our town hall on Monday night uh, for a great presentation. Um, do you know if there's been any thought to uh, the contractor um, reversing their routes like every other week so that the people who got kind of put it out Monday and got picked up Thursday, maybe the following week they reverse the route so that the same streets aren't getting picked up? Later in the week, I, I don't know if anyone's thought of that or whether uh, whether you've heard that that may be a possibility. And if not, it might be something to suggest to them. Um, have you heard anything about that? Or uh, through you, uh, Mayor Nuttall, mm -hmm. to uh, Councillor Nixon, um, I do understand the question and why that would maybe be an ask. But I can tell you that consistent schedules work best for us in order to ensure that uh, addresses, properties are missed, right? We all get used to our garbage day, our garbage time. Um, and I think that is one of the benefits actually of the new leaf and yard waste schedule in that that biweekly from April through to November is consistent. We don't have to remember, oh, is this, is it weekly? Is it, is it? bi-weekly it will be a consistent schedule no I, I understand I, I, I people would still have to put it out Monday but if, if the actual routes of the trucks were changed every couple of weeks so that you know what I'm saying that one week they, they have their route the next week they start at the at the end and go in reverse then people would find that one week they might get picked up early the next week they might get picked up late if they're constantly getting picked up later in the week then a lot of them may not put it out until Tuesday, Wednesday, because the last three weeks the truck came Thursday or Friday. So people will kind of watch and see the trend, mm -hmm. and a lot of people may not uh, put it out. But most are going to be put out Monday anyways, because that's when people rake their leaves on the, on the weekend for the most part. But just a thought. Yeah. Uh, just uh, through you, Mayor Nuttall, just uh, I understand. It was about leaf and yard waste. Apologies. Uh, there. I'm sorry, I should have clarified that <laughs> because okay. the, the, uh, yeah, the regular garbage, that's not going to be an issue for anyone, I'm yeah, sure. It's, all, it's all about the yard waste where we're going to get our questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, on, the, on that yard waste schedule, uh, just to uh, confirm, there will be on the, on the week of leaf and yard waste collection, a, a split truck, so for organics and leaf and yard waste, will be uh, 
dropping by the property uh, to collect organics and leaf and yard on actually the collection day. It just, we can't guarantee collection if you leave it till the end of the week, right? That they might uh, try to uh, come through areas and blitz them, let's say on a Tuesday. Uh, to your point, uh, maybe you know, one day they'll add a Thursday if they have, you know, a truck in the area, potentially. That is why we're really getting that message out. Have it out on Monday just to ensure that you're not missed. Very good. Thank you. Rebecca. Thank you, Mary Nuttall. I just wanted to offer for members of council just to um, draw to your attention that we do have an additional mail out that's going to all households and there is a full page on yard waste and we've addressed <laughs> a lot of these concerns. There's also um, uh, information on our website and it's very um, active. It's being updated practically every hour um, in collaboration with um, Stephanie and her team. So I just want to draw your attention to those two resources. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a couple of questions before we move on. This is it really looking to the future, not to necessarily the changes that are made in May 1st. With regards to the um, actual containers that will be taken down, um, you know, let's say I live at 123, I don't know, Hearst Drive. Uh, we take the containers down. So there's two containers I'll end up with, right? So there'll be the, well, three, I guess. There'll be the garbage, there'll be the recycling, then there's the green waste. Does the green waste change in size or is it consistent with what it currently is right now? Uh, Mayor Nuttall, in regard to when we roll out the automated carts, just for clarification. For the future, yes. yes, yes, yes. So the 120 liter automated uh, cart for organics is bigger. And, um, you know, what's interesting is, you know, I've heard residents say, oh, that looks really large. And we say, uh, yes, we are looking to increase what can go in that green cart and reduce what can go in the black cart. So to your point, to look to the future, uh, it won't be the small, uh, I believe it's 50 liter, 25 liter that we currently have. It's going to look very big. And for us, it's a commitment to the future, really to improve our green bin program, to really encourage everyone to use it every week. So the green bin's getting bigger, essentially. Mm -hmm. The uh, blue stays, the, the new garbage is getting, I would guess, wider than what we would expect in two bags right now. Is that correct? If I was to take two bags of garbage, put them side by side down by the road, this is at least the width of. Is it? Do you know what the width of the, the garbage is, the bin? Uh, Mayor Nuttall, I don't have the uh, the exact width of the set out, but I think to your point, if you look at um, you know at the town halls, we've presented what an existing set out looks like, right? The two smaller garbage cans, um, you know, the the blue and gray bins, and then the the green the green bin itself. And if you look at the entirety of this set out, the current set out is really we're looking to increase the vertical space of the carts and reducing really the footprint of that set out. Okay, so where I guess I'm trying to get is this, um, and, I, and I really do think there needs to be a conversation probably between Michelle's team and, um, and your team as we go forward in the sense that um, we've approved a certain number of units as of right. Uh, the driveways are, I don't know, Rob, what's, what's a driveway? 10 feet? 12 feet wide yeah 13. 13 feet wide but you could potentially have four garbages four recyclings four well, more than four recyclings four green and so when that vehicle is coming down the street to do the automated portion of it is there enough room there to actually meet those requirements um, when we're rolling that portion of it out a year and a half from now um, and, and the, the other piece I would ask on that is when we're, when we're looking at the snow banks, um, we're asking people not to put things in the snow banks. We have reduced, you know, parking. We see it every, everywhere we go around the city, nowhere more than Ward 1, to be honest with you, uh, in terms of the vehicles to, to driveways. And then we're saying, but don't put it on the grass or what's eventually going to be a... a um, uh, a snowbank. It's it's hard for me to imagine how this works. Uh, come that point, and so if we can just when we're coming back with that other report and doing that update, if we can 
anticipate and have those conversations so that it's clear because there are places in the newly annexed area where we were really hoping to see four units as of right and we talked we talked about uh, the amount of dog parks and pet waste I think it was in the plate way to say it um, and all of that well this is kind of one of those other spin-offs that just jumped to my head as we were having this conversation uh, mayor not all um, very interesting so uh, you know for me when we're talking about what does the city look like uh, developments I am actually sitting over here thinking about garbage and servicing and have had uh, these conversations with Ms. Benfield about uh, tying in and a better you know collaborative effort on looking to the future it isn't just even about garbage it is about you know organics and adding the different streams and you know all the good things that we're gonna do so that is absolutely on my mind it's on it's on our list and um, you know in regard to the carts and the set outs and how they look really at the curb the good news is that we're not pioneers so uh, the use of automated uh, cart collection is really, you know, expanding through the province. You know, City of Toronto, County of Simcoe, really our neighbours have done it also. Uh, types of developments where it is tight and uh, our team will be looking into that, uh, perhaps bringing back some pictures so we can see what it looks like at the curb. And uh, lots to work to do on there, uh, to do on there. And um, I think another interesting point on the automated collection is that we're not alone in, the, in this change. What I'm hearing from my municipal colleagues is that this is the way that curbside contracts are going across the province, where again, they're seeing types of developments that are perhaps on smaller spaces. So um, we'll be working on that obviously with, with the development team. Yeah, thank you. I, I actually don't think it's, you know, we're talking about the change of the system itself but the system that's changed that I'm speaking about is actually the planning system. It's a system in which it allows far more units to take mm -hmm. place on a far small piece of, smaller piece of property than we've traditionally had. And so, um, you know, we've had a lot of pressure from the feds, a lot of pressure from the province to be able to make this happen, to provide funds to make this happen. And, and I'm just going off the top of my head here, we might have to invest some of those dollars to figure out a way in order for the pickup of waste to make, make sense. So. Anyway, I'll leave it with you and I look forward to the information coming back. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all of the information. We are complete the uh, presentations for this evening. Council, just give me one moment here. Okay, the first uh, piece on the agenda that was held was Councillor Harvey, DEV 009-24. Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Mayor Nuttall. I'll put the uh, item on the floor as printed. Uh, and I do have a few uh, questions for, uh, for staff. Um, probably Mr. Miller's... Uh, best one because I know we've actually been back and forth in regards to these uh, these items uh, ahead of tonight's meeting um, so my first question through uh, through mayor Nettle uh, would be that if this um, is approved uh, this would afford the landowner a 75 percent savings on their property taxes what would you estimate the yearly impact the, uh, that to be to the city Uh, through you, Mayor Nettle, to uh, Councillor Harvey. So currently, um, they have been receiving the uh, the benefit of, of the reduction in taxes. So the tax amount, you know, there's no immediate impact because we're still collecting the same amount. That's in our base. But if the, if the property wasn't farmed or if this wasn't approved, MPAC is the assessing body and they'll, they'll reassess the, the, the land. So it is just difficult to estimate what... Um, what in, uh, level of taxation we're giving up, but we would estimate anywhere from 50,000 to 175,000 plus a year um, uh, wouldn't be out of uh, out of line. Great, thank you. And uh, just to follow up to that, um, do you know roughly how many years they've had the exemption, and roughly what we might estimate their 
the savings uh, to the current landowner has been over time? Uh, so, so through you, uh, um, Mayor Nell, so it's been seven years or since, I believe, 2016 or 2017. So the challenge, it's difficult to estimate because things have changed in terms of the assessed value of that property. Um, there's been a plan of subdivision. There's been, I think, a road. So, so the, it's not an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. However, if we were to, to assume based on the estimate I just said, assume there's $100,000 that we didn't collect, you know, times that by seven years, it's probably you know, 700000 sort of plus range. Okay. And um, are you aware, is there any other property in the city that uh, has this same exemption that they're requesting to be extended? Specific to agriculture, um, we're not aware of any. I don't think there is any temporary use bylaw. Um, in fact, I know there's not, so I don't know if planning has any other information, but as far as I know, the answer is no specific to agriculture. Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Harvey, no, um, many properties, for example, say in the secondary plan areas, retain to the zoning from the Town of Innisfil zoning bylaw. In some cases, it's agricultural or rural that would allow the agricultural uses to continue without a zoning bylaw. This is a bit unique in that it's in the built boundary. Great, thank you. Uh, just two more questions, um, and I'm, either one of you can take this one. Uh, when other de developers purchase land, and obviously we've s seen quite a bit of that in the annex lands over the last decade or so, um, and they have it rezoned for development, do they start paying the appropriate tax rate upon it being rezoned to residential, let's say? Uh, through you, uh, um, um, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Harvey. So, yes, um, whenever there's a change in use in property, um, it does trigger impact to take a look at the values of those lands. Um, so it, it does get captured. It doesn't happen right away, but there is a time period um, that they will reassess it and they would pay the appropriate tax, and, and sometimes that's sort of backdated. But answer your questions, yes. Great. And my last one, because obviously all those questions were very financial-based, um, so obviously that's my big concern here is uh, the loss of revenue to the city. Does council have the ability to prove the farming use without the tax exemption, or would MPAC and AgriCorp uh, go and assess it for the actual use uh, that they would be using the, for, the property for as a farm uh, moving forward? So through you, Mayor, Mayor Nuttall. Um, so council can't decide the taxes that are approved. Um, MPAC is, has the assessment authority. So they would, uh, um, based on the decision tonight, they would see if the land is actually farmed. Uh, then they would work with AgriCorp, who would confirm if it is a farming business. And if they do, then they would uh, indicate to the, the city of Barrie how, what tax class and, and uh, that we have to apply them in. So there's, there's really n nothing you can do on the tax side. Great, thank you. Um, with the responses that I got, and I knew what the responses were going to be before I asked them, um, I, I struggle to support this. Uh, we've provided a significant tax exemption to a fairly large corporation for almost a decade now, and they're looking to extend it. I wish we had the ability to permit the farming without the tax, ex tax exemption, but unfortunately we don't. Um, so as a result, I, I really struggle to support this. This was before us not that many months ago, and it got rejected at that point. Um, so I, uh, unfortunately, we're dealing with the same thing again, which kind of baffles me, to be quite honest with you. Because um, I'll be quite honest with you, the uh, the organization, or the the company involved, has had zero contact with me since the first decision, uh, leading up to this reappearing on the agenda again. Um, so I'm not quite sure why they felt that councils direction on this would uh, would change but uh, I would uh, strongly hope that uh, council continues uh, with the direction that we had the last time and uh, and votes against uh, the recommended motion here um, but again I'll uh, leave that up to my members uh, Councillor Kungle. Thank you um, 
so I'll speak, I think I said this last time it came forward, but I'm going to support the um, proposed recommendation forward. I think it's um, granted there's always a conversation about taxes, but it's, it's good use of land while it is there. I don't believe it's incentivizing otherwise a developer to develop sooner. Um, I also look at it much more broadly in an economic climate where food security is a big deal and we're seeing situational factors there. It's being used for farming and food production. It impacts the livelihood of a farmer. Um, people may feel differently, but unless we knew that this was impeding something that we could give confidence in, I, I think it deserves a broader scope of context um, rather than just money we're losing in taxes. So I do support. And the history of this too, uh, coming forward, um, I'm not seeing anything of concern from staff recommendation in the context of that. So I'm, I'm in support. support. Uh, Councillor Cuba. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to support uh, the motion as well as printed. Um, and the reason for my thinking on this is, is number one, um, it has been used for agriculture for years, and uh, to continue that, um, I think is is a is a good uh, use of the land until it's developed uh, for industrial purposes. Um, or residential in this case, part of it. Um, I think the other part of it is, as as Ms. Banfield uh, said, this is one of the few properties that's being farmed inside the urban boundary, uh, in the old old boundary, and the uh, properties that are owned by the development industry in the um, annexed areas are, you know, when they're farmed, uh, they do have this tax exemption. Um, available to them. So I think, you know, we are treating um, the people that own these properties consistently uh, with all the others that um, are in, in a similar situation. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. Um, but I think the more important um, piece of it is that I, I really believe that we ought to encourage agriculture as an interim use here. And I see this as for a period of three years. Um, I say let's move ahead for three years and then we'll see where we are at that point. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm just going to jump in because I actually have a couple of questions maybe for Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller, separate report tonight, uh, but on the same subject. Uh, and this was actually Councillor Rachel that pointed this out to me. Um, we have the tax ratios being set for uh, 2024. So I'm looking down at here, it says residential farm property class, new residential, multi-residential, commercial industrial, pipelines, farmlands, managed forest and landfills. Um, is there a reason that this would fall under uh, farmlands instead of residential farm property class? I'm pondering your question, seeing if an answer is going to pop so up on my So let me ask screen. it in another way. Let me ask it another way. If we were to deem it to be falling under the residential farm property class, which has an equal uh, ratio as the new multi-residential uh, and, and multi-residential ratios uh, rates, um, would that not allow them to continue farming but us to keep the dollars uh, through you, Mayor no. It's, no. it's it's the legislation. There's a 75% reduction in it against the prop the residential property rate that they would get that's treated as, as farm class. So what is a residential farm property class, and why is it the same rate as res new residential? I'd have to get back to the details. It is set by MPAC, um, and they're the ones that, that describe it. So I can take that back and, and, and get you a, a clear answer. As the most to loose description is. you can find. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I can tell you it is, we are set in stone as to yeah. the rate that they fit into, but I can get you a clear description on okay. those rates. Okay. Um, I, I apologize. I haven't asked any of these questions up front or let anyone know they're coming, so I'm just going to start firing them off. Can anyone tell me how much it costs to put Brian Drive through? Uh, to you, Mayor Nuttall, uh, I think it's in the $20 million range. Okay. And, and when's that brine drive starting? Because I think they were doing curbs this week, so it can't be that far off. I think they might even be a, ahead of schedule is what I read in the news. 
Um, in all, they are ahead of schedule, and I think they'll be complete next year. And how much did the Harvey Street Bridge cost the city of Barrie and its taxpayers? Uh, Mayanadal, in total, it cost around $76 million. So we have a $100 million investment at this corner, a $100 million investment. And we have a business that's coming forward asking for $175,000 upwards of tax reduction. And that tax reduction to that business is not just like some arbitrary number we pull out of some hidden bank account somewhere. It then gets thrown on the rest of the taxpayers in the city of Barrie who already paid for that bridge to be built and paid for that road to be put in place. The last thing, yes, sorry, Bella, uh, yep. To you, Mayor Nuttall, the, the one thing I wanted to add is uh, in order to put the Bryn Drive North in place, uh, we needed land and uh, the owners of the property did dedicate that to the city at no cost. And was that in exchange for this? Uh, uh, no, Miss, no, Mayor Nuttall, no. Okay. So a hundred million dollar investment. And now $175,000 being requested in the tax reduction. Like, I am totally good with paying less taxes or removing the barriers for development to take place so that we can have more housing and we can have more commerce and we can have more industry and all the things that that land is designated for. In fact, I think staff are working on a CIP right now to, uh, to come forward with some incentives based on the funding we've received from the federal and provincial government. The liberal federal government, the, the, the conservative provincial government have said figure out ways to incent these types of properties that are serviced to be built on and instead we're actually going to incent them the other way if we approve this. We're actually going against the decisions we've been making week after week after week after week. The sacrifices that we're asking for residents to take in terms of or make in terms of the number of units on properties, the setbacks for, for things to be done. And then we're just going to be like, you know what, we're just going to give $175,000 to some business so they don't have to do that. That's ridiculous. That is absolutely ridiculous. I understand somebody farms this property. I, I, I honestly don't know whether they are using it for uh, cattle feed or for if it's going from this place to the Walmart shelf. I, I have no idea. But I'm not willing to subsidize it for $175,000 a year. And I love farmers, and they feed cities, and they do incredible work, and they work way harder than all of us put together. But I cannot ask the people of Barrie to give 175 grand for this purpose. What I can do is I can say to smart centers, bring forward the development now that you're ready. We have the road there. We have the bridge there. We have the services there. And let's start building that part of the city the way that we've envisioned it to happen based on the investments that we've made. Um, I had a couple of, before you, the two of you, I had a couple of other, I had Councillor Morales and somebody else. Thank you, Marinato. I love when you get to, into House of Commons mode. That's when we're going to call it from now on, House of Commons mode. Anybody who wants more of that content, log on to YouTube somewhere. I'm sure it's on there. That's a compliment, by the way. Um, I'm actually a fan of smart centers. Uh, their leadership with the Tesla charging stations on Bayfield was instrumental to the push that we did in 2016-17. Now, we did it on private land with Tesla, they did it on their own private land, but that was, back in 2016-17, the only really uh, plug-in hybrids were the Chevy Volts, not even the Prius then. So I love their leadership. However, on this, I'm on side uh, with, with you, Councillor Harvey and Mayor Nuttall. We're in a housing crisis, in an inflation crisis. I have a hard time incentivizing inaction. Has, like you said, I, I, don't need, I almost feel like I shouldn't have said anything after you, but um, it doesn't matter. I, I, food is great, and we need to, you know, farmers feed communities, but this land is ripe for housing. That's, it, that, that, that's almost the, the words I was writing while you were talking, ripe for housing and ready to go. So I'd much rather them, like you said, uh, take a look at the CIP. We've got money. It's, the policies are being fleshed out. And if they want to move numbers around on their pro formas through a CIP, which is action instead of inaction, and almost, I'm not accusing them of using a farmer as a um, cover, but I just don't want the whole farming thing to get into this conversation. This is a co conversation about inaction versus action with housing on the line and an inflation and housing crisis. So I'll be supporting the, uh, the ward council on this. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I'll go Councillor Corso, then Councillor Kungle. 
Okay, through you, Mayor Nuttall, to um, Bala. Could you please expand a little bit on the property, or sorry, I'm not sure if it was your, uh, um, the staff that mentioned the, uh, the property owner um, giving property to the city? Is that what I understood? Can I have a better explanation of what that, what happened there? Uh, through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Corser. Uh, yeah, what I was saying was, uh, so this property owner does have a planning application uh, underway. And uh, as part of that, uh, we did ask for them to dedicate the lands we need to build the road. And they have done that. And that's what facilitated the construction of the road. Okay, and if I could follow up with uh, just trying to better understand process. So they have a planning application in for that piece of land, and I might, I'm not sure if this is good to you or Ms. Banfield, um, is at what part of that planning application would the zoning change on that piece of land? Uh, through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Corser, I think Ms. Banfield can probably give you a better answer on that. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Corser. So the zoning is already approved. The zoning bylaw amendment for the ultimate use of the property is approved. I believe it was approved, I want to say maybe the end of 2023. Don't quote me on the date. Uh, they also have a draft plan of subdivision um, that's also approved. So draft plans of subdivision have a list of conditions, and then you'd move to registration. Typically, we would get any sort of road widenings or road land through the draft plan process and ultimately through the registration. In this case, because of the timing, um, the applicant agreed to dedicate it early because we haven't registered the subdivision. And that's the, the land that um, uh, but the, the general manager is talking about. That's the land we got early, um, earlier than we would normally have gotten it, which is, is something that not everyone does. Let's just put it that way. Um, so that's where we are with the planning process. The intention always was for this agricultural use to be um, just interim while they are kind of, you know, clearing their draft plan conditions and, and hoping to register their draft plan. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Thank you. And, and um, for the zoning that's changed... I feel like I should know this, so uh, I'm probably asking a question I should already know, but many people at home probably don't either. So um, what point does the tax change on a zoned piece of property? Once it's built, once the shovel hits the dirt, when does the tax rate change to, as it's, it's now to residential? So three of are not all. So um, there's a number of factors that MPAC uses in determining uh, when it changes, so change in use. Um, even if this property was, was granted the right to farm and they didn't farm it, you know, MPAC would assess that, well, you're not farming it, so therefore you'd be charged the regular rate. Uh, rate. Uh, and Michelle mentioned plans of subdivision. So those are all triggers for MPAC to take a look. Really, it's the change of use is the trigger, and then they go through their process, do their assessment, and then uh, inform the city. Okay, so understanding that not your circus, not your monkeys, if you will, with the MPAC. Um, do you understand, uh, can you give a little more clarity on, uh, so MPAC, um, if they stopped farming on the land tomorrow, MPAC would then, could or might or might not change the, it, it takes a long time for that red tape kind of thing to change over to the taxing difference? Sorry, I'm not asking that very clearly, but... Yeah, I think you said, how long does it take? So it takes time, right? Yeah. So obviously they're not going to go out day by day. It, it'll, it'll take some time, but they will go back in time, right? So if they... Oh, retroactively. If, they, if this gets approved in, let's say, six months, a year from now, there was no farming activity on that land. Well, that's... You didn't farm for this past year, and, and, and that would be a reconsideration. Okay, so, um, so it's an ongoing process. Yeah. It's not an automatic. It does take some time on that. It's, okay. Um, um, but at the end of the day, it does generally get captured. I'm having a really tough time with this one because the first time this came in front, I was like, no, no, they shouldn't be getting away with this, this uh, deal on their land. But now having, uh, I, I look around the city and thankfully we're having um, more shovels in the ground of, of land that have been sitting stagnant for quite some time. 
Um, it seems that things, a couple of projects have moved forward. But then there's other projects that are sitting around our city who just, which have just turned into basically like trash sites that are um, full of litter and um, refuge and things are not being kept clean on them and they're not being used for good purposes. So at looking at that, I'm like, this is a good use for that land. But I don't want it to be an excuse or some kind of a deal for them to actually get a tax break. Can they use this land that they now own? I don't know who I'm asking this question to. Um, can they use this land that they now own as a bargaining chip or to get um, loans or any kind of deals to buy other land or new developments? Could they use this as part of their portfolio as something that they could do to boost their company in any kind of um, this is what we have in holdings? Could they use it to another, um, to use it uh, like you would for collateral on a loan? Does that, um, again, asking a strange question, but... So through you, Mayor Nettles, so I think, yes, is changing the tax class to farming going to help their bottom line? I mean, are they, they will save money on the taxes. I don't know if it changes the value. Mm -hmm. But answer your question, yeah, they could if they own the land, which they do. Yeah, so they can turn around and say, well, we've got this much of a... Uh, for if another development, they wanted to do another development, they could say, we're holding this land in Barrie, we have this value, so if a loan, I don't know, car loan, you know, I have this, make this much money, I have this much in assets, so I can get this loan, because or car loan is a bad example, a mortgage field, something that they could use as a bargaining chip to do other developments elsewhere. I guess that's C the Councilor, question. The, the answer yeah. is that the, the value of the land is derived from uh, the zoning, the usable property, and the densities and uses on it. Those have all been uh, essentially, for the most part, designated as of this point. Is that correct, Ms. Banfield? Have we generally uh, planned out what's going to happen there, and right now it's past yeah. the draft plan of subdivision into the actual site right. plan? Is that correct? Through you, Mary uh, the draft plan is approved, uh, so they haven't gotten into site plan yet. They're working on but the zoning is the zoning is approved, and the the draft plan conditions have been issued. So, so to answer your question, the because you were asking essentially about financing of other projects yes. using the capital inside or the 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 um, the, the value inside of this property. Yes. And the answer is its value is not based on whether it's getting farmed or not. It's based on what it's been zoned at, what the expected ROI is going to be, etc. Um, I just wanted to know, generally speaking, holding that land. Generally speaking, it's it's not on the farming; it's on the zoning, yep. etc. Okay, okay. And with the site plan, as as we've discussed before, um, there is no mandatory timeline in which they are forced to do development on that piece of property if they have that um, um, this part in the process. Is that correct, Ms. Mayfield? Through you, Mayor Nettle, to Council Corser. So the temporary use zoning bylaw would be for up to three years. Um, that's, that's before Council this evening. And then draft plan conditions, um, your first kind of approval is good for three years um, to go from draft plan to registration. So at this point, there is a bit of time for the applicant to get some detailed details for the projects, you know, in the next couple of years. So the, the site plan and the, the, the deal on taxes is pretty much aligned with three years, which would be where the deadline runs for them to actually move forward with their planning application. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Nuttall, uh, to Councillor Corser, um, certainly items like draft plans, uh, draft plan approvals can be extended. That's certainly something that, that we've seen in recent years if they haven't gone far enough along. Um, so there is, um, and, and, and it's a big property, so it's most likely going to be developed in phases. If council remembers the draft plan, there's a school block, there's, you know, some, a bit of kind of mixed-use development, mm -hmm. some residential, so it most likely will be developed in, in phases. Okay. 
Uh, I'll leave it there. I'll take all the rest of my questions I sandbag staff with um, offline. And uh, this is a tough one because I'm seeing what's happening to other land that's supposed to be developed around the city and the condition that it's in. And at least this is a good use of land, but then I'm torn with the tax break. So I just have a lot to uh, keep me up at night until we decide what to do with this. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Nixon, and I have. Oh, sorry, Councillor Kungle, I hopped over you. Uh, so we'll go with Councillor Kungle first, then Councillor Nixon, and then Deputy Mayor Thompson. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, through you, um, Mayor Nettle, um, to staff. Um, so when we were talking about part of this conversation around the what I heard was the gifting of their property to the city so we could develop that aspect first. So was that a gift to us or was there an exchange of funds for that property? Through you, Marinello, to Councillor Kungle, it was an early dedication of land that most likely would have come to the city through the draft plan of subdivision. So it wasn't an exchange for anything. It wasn't a gift, it wasn't a donation, it was uh, an early dedication of land that would have come as the draft plan of subdivision advanced. Um, but as I pointed out, not everybody, not every property owner will do that. They'll wait till their draft plan um, advances. Um, so it is, um, it is recognizing the importance of the, the project. Um, you know, Bala and team worked closely to get that dedication in advance and the property owner agreed to do it in advance. Is there anything that would be um, relevant for us to, to further appreciate around, did that come as a cost or loss of revenue to that individual at that time to do so, or is that just just good partnership? Uh, through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Congle, uh, it's normal practice for developments to dedicate those lands. Uh, so I think, as uh, Ms. Banfield mentioned, I think the difference here was they were willing to do it earlier than when they actually registered the subdivision. But this is normal practice. Okay. When I look at this, um, and I was trying to recall, and it's uh, unfortunate there's been a gap from the past conversation where the developer was here speaking to this, but if I'm recalling correctly, the context around this was that while it is a phased development, I believe that there was an interest in making sure that that farmer would just phase out the parcel of the land that they're farming and would be able to continue to do so uh, if we supported that zoning, but um, that there was an appreciation that that is a partnership that had benefit of continuing for farming while the phased approach happened. So it wasn't an all or nothing. I don't see any evidence, nor am I in any way confident, that creating a penalty around pulling the pulling this relationship to then um, remove the tax benefit they're getting is going to incentivize development earlier. Um, so I'll, I'll put that there. Um, the other piece is I didn't believe that this current developer was even charging the farmer for rental of that because it was a pretty amicable relationship around use of lands and how it's being used. And I think for the purposes tied in the memo around our strategic plan, like it is a good use of ground cover and of, around supporting agriculture. I, I think if we just see this um, as, you know, how do we recover the taxes, the tax break, then I'm thinking where else are we giving tax breaks uh, and not really considering that in this conversation. So anything from previous conversations to let's waive DCs to incentivize certain developments. Like we can be creative in certain areas, but I think it behooves us to look more broadly at certain situations and not just a tax break. So somewhere down the line, if we want to incentivize the fourth unit as a right and we're saying let's waive DCs, we still have to be whole. So we're still looking at different ways in which we're giving tax incentives or tax breaks incentives on different developments. Um, I, I see this as a good partnership. I see it as a good, good use. Um, I think it's an appropriate framing of up to three years. And if this individual is coming forward sooner, great. But I don't, I don't feel that removing this incentivizes development any sooner. Thank you. Um, before Deputy Thompson, it, 
the, there's no penalty. This is the standard. They're asking for an exception, an exemption to what the actual standards are. It's actually a penalty to the taxpayers, not a penalty to the developer. Councillor Nixon. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Nuttall. Um, yeah, I, 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 I agree with Councillor Congo that it, that it may not incentivize a developer to build any quicker. It may. There, there's nothing more exciting than when we meet with a developer and we see all this big presentation and, and, and about what they're going to do and how it's going to help the city reach its goals to, to build homes. Uh, there's nothing more frustrating than years later seeing an empty lot and seeing things not happen. And, you know, we do not have the ability, people ask me all the time, well, can't we just penalize them? Can't we do that? No, we can't. We, we, we do not have the ability to do that. Um, on the other hand, I, I don't see why we should be rewarding developers for not proceeding. So instead of penalizing them, we're actually rewarding them. Um, you know, so I, I, I agree with Councilor Morales. You know, Smart Centers is a great developer. Uh, they've been a great partner to the city. I think this tax uh, change is certainly not going to affect the price of their stock. They're a pretty, pretty big operation. Um, and uh, if, if they choose after this to continue farming, then... They can, they can certainly do that, but uh, I will not be supporting it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Nuttall. Um, through you to staff, uh, and I'll let CAO Prowse, uh, but I, I think it's Ms. Reed in government relations. Um, is there any tax incentive through the federal or provincial for farming, uh, like an exemption? Would they, was there a subsidy? in either of those levels of government? Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to, uh, to uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, I'm not an expert. The only one I'm aware of is the, is the farm tax incentive program, which I think is actually in the tax ratios uh, that Council also has on their agenda tonight, uh, which is a 75% uh, discount effectively from the residential uh, tax rate. That's the only one I'm aware of, but I'm not an expert in the field. I'm not sure if Mr. Miller has more information. Which would translate basically to another tax break from the Barry taxpayer opposed to the federal or provincial tax break, right? We wouldn't be reimbursed to make us whole, correct? Uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, I'm, I'm not sure I'm clearly understanding your question. Maybe you could rephrase it for me. So on the residential farm in the tax ratio, it's a 75% reduction of the tax, which is what we collect as municipal tax. You know, just let's use, uh, if it was $1,000, they would pay 25 or $250. We are not receiving money from the federal or provincial to make us whole on that $1,000. That's correct. On the difference, that's correct. You're not. Uh, right. Okay. So, so that's what I look at this. I, we're being asked to subsidize this with no other level of government subsidizing. So I, I think it's unfair um, to the taxpayer. Now... I understand the the need for farmland, but there really is no evidence other than the, the land's farmed, which, you know, drive a tractor, turn the low soil, but there's no proof that that is farmed to anything other than a tax break. So um, I will not support the recommendation, and I will support uh, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, and Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, and through you, I thought this was going to be a quick one, so I'm a little bit surprised by this conversation, but I, you know, I, I'm kind of feeling the way Councillor Cursor is feeling. I was a little bit torn, and I was picturing you know, a sad farmer and food security, and you were pulling at my heartstrings for a second, and then I have to realize that this is a billion-dollar company that owns this property that we're now giving multi-billion. I just looked, I just was shown, and my jaw fell to the floor. Like, if they have it in their heart that they really want to support this farmer and food security, I'm pretty sure, like, can we not negotiate that they cover the $175,000 tax grant that they're going to be given instead? Like, is there not some sort of way we can say, hey, if you want to continue this, then this is what you pay the city, period. You know, we'll give you, we'll give you, I won't give you any months, but maybe I'll give you six months, but in six months, you cover the shortfall that the rest of the residents are paying if you want to continue this out of the goodness of your heart, then I'm all for it. But otherwise, I agree exactly what you just said. I think they're turning soil here and, you know, getting whatever grants they can. Why wouldn't they? I don't see, I mean, I love the idea of this actually being farmers and employing immigrants and all of that goodness and, you know, supplying food to the food banks. 
I don't think that's the reality here. I think, you know, if it was, the conversation would be very, very different around this table. So I, unfortunately, am going to have to agree with Councillor Harvey here and, and uh, not support this as it is. Um, I, I do support if there's a conversation with the developer, give us a call. If, if, you, if you really want to continue farming this, make a deal. Figure out how, we can, uh, how you can pay the shortfall that's on the backs of the city taxpayers. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Uh, Councillor Corser. Just to be clear, I wasn't really concerned about the farmer per se, just <laughs> the, how the land's going to end up. I um, meant it was a tough decision. Yeah, that's not, all. not yeah, the yeah. tough decision for sure. Tough decision, very much so. Um, uh, I, uh, if I recall correctly from the last conversations that we had regarding this, if we decided to change the um, tax. The, the use of the land, so it would be taxed at a higher rate. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. That would mean that the far it, the, would no longer be allowed to use that piece of land for agricultural and farming. Is that correct? So if we did change the tax rate to um, residential, whatever it may be, industrial, then the ability to actually use that land as farmland so it would be taken away, is that correct? So through you, uh, Mayor Nutt, I'll just jump in if, if you want, Michelle. Just So, so count, council, council is not choosing the tax rate. That That's MPAC's job. You're, you're being asked to approve a temporary use bylaw on the land to permit farming. And from that decision, that will impact, if you prove it, they can farm. If you don't, they can't farm it. I believe they do have some recourse that they could appeal this decision to El, uh, the LPAP board um, to dispute it. But but ultimately, you're you're, pat, you're deciding how you're going to use the land, and from that, that drives the tax. So if you can't farm, then MPAC won't assess it as, as farm land because they're not allowed to. Okay, so I just didn't want um, uh, I've heard it said that it, like like so if we take the use away then they can't out of the goodness of their heart not to um, paraphrase anyone around the table but they can't actually allow that farmer to keep farming so through you correct i mean they could and then the city has to enforce force their zoning bylaws and, and tell them no you can't okay so they can't just generously say we'll pay the taxes and keep the farmer if we take away the farmer the taxes go up no. Okay. Sorry. The, I, I'm sorry. I keep referring to the taxes. I should be referring to the land use. My apologies. To be clear, you're, you're deciding on how they're going to use the land. So out of the goodness of their heart, they'd be violating the city's bylaw, right? So, so no. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Any other? Uh, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nuttall. Just to put a little more color to this property, because obviously it was last June when we approved the uh, the zoning on it. Like, we're, we're talking about roughly 82 acres that's divided in half by Brine Drive. The east side of it's all going to be commercial, and the west side's supposed to be residential for 155 semi-detached homes, a bunch of townhouses, and two apartment blocks because it got downsized due to the uh, request for a school in it. The fact that it was dedicated to the city early, A, benefits the city, but it actually really benefits the developer. So, like, I don't look at that as a good deed. It was a good deed for themselves because now that land is going to be ready that much sooner. And as all of a sudden, they could flip this land for probably 10 times what it was worth because now it's got full servicing available to it in, in short order. Um, so, like, I mean, this is just baffling to think that we've got uh, such a rich corporation coming and looking for a small tax savings. Well, small to them, pretty big to your average taxpayer here in the city of Barrie. And we're in the middle of a housing crisis. We need houses built. And everybody's heard the fact that we're running out of commercial lands and we need more commercial properties built. So we need to see shovels in the ground and by allowing this farming to potentially occur for the next three years is only going to potentially help slow that down. So I just don't see where there's a benefit to the city by moving forward with this 
Um, but those are my comments, and uh, I do appreciate some of the comments from my, some of my colleagues around the table. Councillor Harris. I'll be really quick. I, I think 2024 is probably a good year to leave this land fallow, so, uh, which is good farming practice. So, and I think uh, the better investment for this land is really to get it developed. So whatever we can do to incentivize that, that I'm full support of. So I don't support the uh, recommendation. I support Councillor Harvey. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Harvey, you didn't move an amendment. You spoke against it, right? Yes, that's correct. I just uh, had I'm suggested that, that people, <laughs> uh, people uh, vote against uh, the recommended motion. So your, your request is, yeah, I don't need to repeat it. Uh, I'll just, um, one last question. How long has this land been like this? I think it was like 2016 or something like that. Is that correct? Yes, Mayor Nettle, that's correct. Okay. So the request is essentially for 24, 25, 26, or is it 20, does this get them through to 27? Mayor Nettle, it would be potentially for a three-year period, so, yeah, mid-2027. So into 27 point. Correct. Right. So a dog's life is 10 to 13 years. Mm -hmm. This temporary use by law is literally a dog's life at this point. Uh, I will call the vote. All those in favor of the item... One, all those against, it is defeated. Separate report. Separate report's been requested by Councillor Morales. We'll now move on to, Gabriel, you're a great sport, by the way. You're, you're hanging in there with us, so thank you. Sorry? There was no amendment, Councillor Corser. Oh, I, I didn't see, see that. So you voted in favor of the recommendation? Okay. Yeah, I think a separate report's been requested as well, so. Yep. Um, our next held item is DEV 013-24, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw Amendment Application 48 Dean Avenue, and that was held by Council Morales. Council Morales, could you put the item on the floor, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Nuttle. I mean, I just want to pull it up here. Okay, so the item, I wanted to put the item on the floor, and uh, everybody ha should have the amendment circulated that Ms. Cook uh, circulated earlier today. So if, if you want to follow, please pull up the 4.39 p.m. email. So I'm going to put forward the amendment as follows. Um, that a section 2G be added that states that provisions of a privately owned public space, bracket, POPS, close bracket, comma, located within the defined front yard setback. That a section 2H be added that states, colon, bra uh, colon, um, colon, quotation mark, a minimum front yard setback of 9 meters and a maximum front yard setback of 19 meters, close quotation mark. That a section 2I be added that states, colon, quotation mark, a minimum of rear yard setback of three meters, quotation mark, that a section 3B be added that states the development, execution, and implementation of a design process, including opportunity for community input, identifying appropriate size, location, and layout, and design treatment of a privately owned public space POPs located within the front yard setback. And finally, that a section 3C be added that states demonstration of due diligence and best efforts to create a shared access or accesses within adjacent property owners. And I can speak to that. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mary Nuttall. So uh, as some of you will remember during the kind of initial meeting we had of this, uh, some of the points raised um, by myself was including uh, moving towards a very innovative model that privately, uh, privately owned public land uh, spaces, uh, so POPs, which is kind of this phenomenon that the City of Toronto has developed and hopefully we will be developing soon about having situa unique situations where the land is owned by the Condo Corp, uh, but maybe it's a public garden, maybe it's a community garden, maybe it's a, a, a sitting area for seniors, some, some sort of creative facilities. This isn't something, and uh, Councilor Gross, I remember you asked a really good question to staff, what is this? Uh, this isn't something we're, I'm, I'm kind of inventing on the ground. This is something the City of Toronto has established, pioneered, and has been successful. So that it really speaks to um, some of the 
this amendment as well. Uh, Mayor Nuttall, you'll remember that the residents of the terraces came forward with a uh, uh, petition that uh, you asked me to put in our circulation list, and I did, about developments on sort of parquet. They were calling it parquet, has now evolved to two pops because we still need to do our part, and more specifically, Ward 9 needs to do its part to sell land, to get housing built, and to fundraise money in order for us to move forward with city building important initiatives. So the happy middle with that is the land is for sale, let's get going, let's get some housing built, let's bring money in, while at the same time finding a happy middle with the pops. In order to achieve that, that is uh, section uh, 2H would be that the minimum front yard setback be at a minimum 9 meters, providing an adequate pops, or at a maximum 19 meters. And I'll thank uh, Mr. Jordan Lambie for the flexibility with that, because uh, design will be figured out at a later stage. But in order to accommodate that without affecting the buildable footprint, which was a key emphasis that you communicated to me, uh, the reduction of the rear yard setback needs to be done to 3 meters. If staff, I sent an email probably well, three hours ago now, uh, if staff could pull up a couple of the pictures that I sent earlier. Um, this is the rear, pr rear yard of the property. Uh, there's the dirt, Mary Nettle, that should have never been there. Uh, it accumulates garbage. Uh, and I just want to give context for, res for counselors who are reading my long amendment and going, what's the deal here? So um, what I'm essentially asking for is a three meter reduction. So right there from my camera that was last night, um, my mom was waiting in the car, and uh, that's obviously more than three meters. Could we go to the next picture, please? Uh, that's another one uh, facing specifically um, towards the, the, the subject land. Um, and as we saw from the earlier picture, what backs onto it, so the privacy is just a one-story strip plaza that's not going anywhere. Uh, it's currently owned by our male properties. Next picture, please. That, this one itself is on the Painswick Library side. So I literally just turned around. I was kind of in the middle. Um, I didn't put the garbage there, as what I'm, <laughs> I promise. Uh, what I'm trying to get at is that long uh, setbacks sometimes, if they're not programmed effectively, can just kind of become, especially with, with a bit of a grade, can become a collector. So in unique situations like this one, uh, the, reduce, uh, the reduced setback, since it has a reason but for the pops out in the front yard, makes sense. And I think there should be one more picture. Or two. This is on the other side of that fence, in case you're wondering what's on the other side of that fence. It's just a laneway for rear, uh, rear deliveries for the strip plaza. Um, and I used the nifty little feature on, on uh, I iOS there uh, to do a, a, a measurement. Again, not, didn't have uh, geological uh, uh, tools, but that is roughly a 2.5 meter um, landscape buffer. That's not a setback, because that would be from the building. But uh, the, on the other side of the fence, there's 2.5. And on this side, that's why I'm proposing that a three meter um, setback is more than appropriate. It actually is a little bit higher than the landscape buffer. And is there one more picture, staff, or is that it? That is it? Okay, perfect. So those are just contextual pictures, and I'm happy to receive any questions, Mayor Nuttall. Any questions or comments for Councilor Morales on this amendment this evening? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. Oh. Yep, Sorry, and thank you for the explanation. I guess I'll just give staff an opportunity to say um, through you, Mary Nettle, to Ms. Banfield, anything else we should appreciate with the changes there that um, staff would have any comments on at this time? Through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Kungal. No, no, nothing okay. to add. Okay, thank you. Councillor Corson. All the way um, um, through you, Mayor Nettle, to I guess Michelle, Mich uh, Ms. Banfield. Um, my question would be, uh, talking about land dedications or, <laughs> or whatever it may be, uh, I always have a problem with um, with leaving the um, giving control over public spaces to private entities. I know that this is a new, um, maybe not new, but something that's becoming popular. But I think that uh, public spaces should be owned by the public. And I'm just wondering if there would be an opportunity to maybe like the land that was dedicated for the roads that we were just discussing, um, would there be an opportunity uh, for having that conversation with the developer that would take this land? Or is this a totally different scenario whatsoever? Fill me in, you know what I mean? Through you, Mayor Nettle, to Councillor Corser, staff um, are trying to 
present to council a zoning amendment that would um, effectively change the zoning on the property to um, accommodate a highest and best use. On all, uh, staff expect that there will be continued conversations uh, with any sort of prospective purchaser, um, and there are many things that details that would still need to be worked out. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? It carries on the main motion is amended. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Oh, voting. <laughs> all those in favor? It carries. We'll move on to the next, uh, the next item, uh, which is uh, DEV 014-24, City Initiated Zoning Bylaw 29 and 35 Sperling Drive, and that's been held by Councillor Kungle. Councillor Kungle, the floor is yours. Could you put the item on the floor as well, please? Yes, I'll put the item on the floor as printed, um, and then I have an amendment. Um, and sorry, I've got locked out of my little... I'm scrolling. Uh, so um, I'll, I'll share the amendment, and then it's a, it's an additional paragraph. Um, so not changing anything that's presented forward. Um, that in addition to uh, the motion that staff and development services be requested to further examine any additional standards that committee deems worth exploration beyond the permissions of the official plan, including a special policy area to permit increased height and density on the site and report back to general committee in June of 2024. And I can speak to that. Yes, Councilor Florsher. Um, so with um, complete respect to staff, um, I think having done a, a really expeditious job of getting best um, height and use for different properties, I think we've looked at Sperling as being a unique site um, while it's being looked for sale because uh, of uh, its current zoning, which is highway, I think, industrial, uh, to still support the zoning to uh, residential mixed use and whatnot, but that we can move forward with that zoning so there's nothing that's changing what is being proposed. Uh, however, um, with its current location, when we talk about trying to really look at best use uh, with infill, the opportunity to really explore if we can go a little bit higher than what was presented. Uh, to do that, it's my understanding that um, at this time we would actually look to have to change the official plan. Uh, so the proposed amendment triggers then a next step by which planning staff would have to go out with public consultation. I think that's something that my understanding is could be done in May with a report back to us by June uh, to see uh, if we can look at um, exploring greater, greater density and height on that space than what has been proposed to date. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Uh, any comments or questions on the amendment itself? Uh, Councilor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mary Nuttle. I'll, I'll be supportive of, of the amendment. Uh, we're all wards, but we're all one city, and the Sperling one, it's right by the highway, right? So this is definitely, uh, I'm in support of, of any initiatives that can, again, get more housing, whether it's Ward 9 or Ward 3, we're all one great city, uh, and maximize units and density. And if that means we have to do that research, then, then that's the right thing to do. Thank you, Councilor. Any other comments or questions? Members, seeing none, I'm of the same mind, and uh, thank you, Councillor Congo, because I know that these aren't always the easiest when you're increasing density inside of your ward. But I'll just remind everybody of this: uh, two items. Number one, I ran on downtown transit hubs along the highway for density, uh, for serious density, um, and the more we do these types of projects uh, and we're able to provide them and get them to market. Uh, the less people will feel the pain inside the neighborhoods five and ten years from now uh, through smaller, uh, what I heard were gentle uh, density, um, but don't feel so gentle sometimes to the folks who live there. So thank you, Councilor Cumble. Uh All those in favor of the amendment? It passes. And on the main motion, any comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? It carries. We're now on to DEV 016-24. Councillor Hamilton, uh, you held it, uh, and so uh, if you could put it on the floor first and then go from there. Yes, thank you, and through you, I'd like to put the item on the floor, and I have an amendment. Uh, I think the amendment was sent out at 7.34 p.m. tonight, a revised amendment. 
uh, and it reads that a second paragraph would be added that reads that $150,000 be considered as part of the 2025 capital budget for the design, permitting, and construction of a pedestrian crossing installation of a pedestrian crossing at Hearst Drive in Manor Gate. <sighs> Sorry, <laughs> my eyes crossed there for a second. I can speak to that. The floor is yours. Thank you. This has been a, a pedestrian crossing at this area has been a request of residents uh, in this area for a number of years now. So I do want to say thank you to staff for taking the time to look into this. It was really appreciated by the residents. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Hearst Drive, maybe on that side of the table, if you don't come over uh, to our wards very often, uh, it is a very busy arterial road. Uh, you can read in the report that there's up to 12,000 vehicles on average on a daily basis. Uh, it is also one of those arterial ro roads that has residential houses on both sides with, with driveways. Uh, perhaps not the best planning back in the day for the volume of traffic it's receiving, but, but it is what it is. So uh, a highly pedestrian area, tons of kids uh, and residents in the area, close to parks. Um, there's a plaza in the area that's the only one in the region with a convenience store there, which is heavily trafficked by kids. Uh, and if you look at the staff report, it does meet all the requirements uh, in terms of the volume of traffic that goes through, uh, the distance from a traffic control device, but it didn't reach the pedestrian volume limit. And I, I just want to point out a limitation of the study and the fact that this was, you know, done in one day over an eight-hour period. And I don't ne think it necessarily captures the number of kids that are actually crossing this specific stretch of road on Hearst Drive because there's no other lights. As you can see, it's over 330 meters to the next sort of intersection uh, and with a store and a park right there. It's heavily used. There's day camps in the area, camps in the areas, school. There's a bus stop there that kids cross over to get to as well. So it has been a huge concern. It was something I heard knocking on doors over and over and over again by residents. So, and I think evenings and weekends is predominantly when you're actually seeing that those crossings of those children's, especially during the summer months when school is out. So uh, while I appreciate the study, I do think there's some limitations to that. And for me, roads safety, we all know, is the number one concern in our, ward, in our wards, and this for me is the number one road safety concern in my ward. Um, so I'm bringing it forward that it be considered as part of the 2025 um, budget intake, capital budget intake, um, and happy to take any questions or, or comments or concerns on that. Any questions or comments? I'm going to start with Councillor Corser. Uh, yeah, um, supportive, absolutely. Um, I'm just wondering at this point, is there anything in the interim that is being done to make the, the, the crossing here safer? Because that's a yeah. long way away I can take that. Summer. I've worked with staff closely on this. As I said, Hearst driving in itself is probably the number one concern I get from a road safety perspective, and it's really hard because you can't put speed bumps on its arterial road. Um, so, I mean, Ms. Bansfield and her team has been incredible to work with me to try to sort of figure out different options for, for that area because there's, there's not a lot, truthfully, on arterial roads and just the way it was designed. Um, so there, there's no other measures right now uh, that have been looked at for that. We are still exploring some other options like we've talked about rumble strips, we've talked about different ideas, but we can't do planners, you can't do all of the basic things that we would normally do in different neighborhoods uh, just because it is an arterial road. So um, again, just for all the reasons I read it, the parks, the plaza, the convenience store being the only one in the region, um, I think it's worthwhile even though it didn't reach the pedestrian volume. Again, I think if you were to come out on any evening, even during the week, work week, mm -hmm. uh, summer weekends, you would see that it's, it's actually much busier than this is coming across. But yeah, nothing's being done, unfortunately, right now. Yeah, absolutely supportive. And Ms. Banfield can probably add to it if, if, yeah. But I think, yeah, we've been working really closely together on this stretch to say, what can we do? Uh, and this is an option. Yep. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Deputy Mayor. Uh, thanks, Mayor Nuttle. Um, maybe just, can we maybe, would you take a friendly and maybe with that um, direction, have staff revisit some of the times that you had mentioned? Um, just to, to kind of give a little bit more color to the, the request because yeah, it, and I know that uh, I spoke with Mayor Nuttall who used to represent the area, and there was lots of complaints and stuff about it, and maybe there's a way to, you know, see the the volume with in the summertime and stuff. I don't know if that's possible because, the problem is, and as it states in the report, when they are, underutilized, they actually like. Pedestrian crosswalks are probably the worst thing you can put on an underutilized. Stop signs are probably second and stuff, but maybe there's like a signalized intersection, which if it's only at certain times, 
and it's hard to capture in the test. But maybe if that just as a friendly before we went ahead with the money, and I know it's for 2025 budget, but if we can maybe get staff to do a little more thorough. Councillor? Yes, sure. <laughs> is, that a, is that a friendly? I Sure, so you'd want to change the wording to staff. Um, it could be, say, in, in, the, in the meantime or, or prior to the we Maybe work with staff to a lot. Sometimes you're the ward councillor, you're getting the complaints, you'll know some good times where you yeah. just, like, have the study done, not as a... Do we need that as part of the amendment, more, though, or is that something we can work on prior to the approval the in 2025? Like this, so it's not <laughs> oh. friendly. Yeah, so I, I going to say, so it doesn't sound like a friend, yeah. friendly to me. So I, I'll, I, uh, I'll put an amendment to the amendment. Okay, if you want to do that, then, then that's fair. Are there any comments or questions on the amendment to the amendment? <laughs> Councillor Corser. Um, with the understanding that uh, this is a ongoing issue in the area, and uh, I'm just wondering what uh, further investigation, if everything is ticked all the boxes except for the, the, um, the volume of the traffic and, and all the things, just to, uh, I'm just wondering what further investigation will um, pull up that the staff hasn't already investigated, would they actually go further into different times and days or? Uh... So yeah, through you, I think what uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson's requesting is that staff go back and look at the pedestrians that are crossing it at different periods of the day. So the day that the study was conducted, it's conducted in one day for an eight hour period during when kids are in school. Um, so I don't, does staff actually do evenings and weekends with that is that something we would actually normally do in terms of data collection? Through you, Mayor Nettle, to uh, Councillor Hamilton, we can, we can adjust the times for sure. Okay, I'm gonna stick with my original amendment, but um, again, if, if W. Mayor Thompson wants to put forward a, a secondary amendment, he's welcome to do so. So there's an amendment uh, to the amendment on the floor. <laughs> Councillor Goose, you're speaking to the amendment to the amendment? Yes, uh, I have, thank you, Mayor Nadal. I have just point of clarity. Uh, question to the clerk. Is it okay if we separate this staff report? Through you, Mayor Nadal, to uh, Councillor Nagusi. Yes, we can make it a separate report so it can be its own um, section on the council agenda next week. I think actually, uh, Madam Clerk, what, what Councillor Nagusi is asking is, if the portion related to uh, Bateau and Silver Creek Crescent can be separated out from the portion related to Hearst Drive and Manor Gate. My apologies, I misunderstood the question. Um, yes, it can be voted on separately. So at the so, appropriate so time, uh, Councillor, when we get to the actual um, main motion, uh, I believe at that point we could then have it separated out. Three Mayor Nettel to members of council. Um, it, it's essentially going to be voted on separately anyway um, because unless he wants, I'm not understanding if he wants to separate it because he wants the bateau part separated or the amendment put forward by Councillor Hamilton. He, he wants so. them as two separate uh, reports in the sense that, sorry, I'm just moving my so, yeah, page. Yeah, it has only place. one item number. Yes. And I just want to make sure, you know, does the vote on the amendment affects on the Mapleton uh, report? Okay, so the, so the amendment would be voted on separately as an amendment right now. And then it would, we would vote on the main motion as amended, and it would have both parts, the bateau part and the Hearst Drive as one, as one motion. So you're essentially, if you, the Hearst Drive one would already be voted on separately. If when you got to council, you wanted to make an amendment so that both parts were voted on separately, you could do that as well. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Yeah. So what council, uh, the clerk would be able to help you prepare that for next week. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions on the amendment to the amendment to the main motion? We're having a lover spat tonight. <laughs> so we can probably go to this place 
any time, and the numbers are going to go up, but you're not going to get more kids crossing the street, and uh, or significantly more. Maybe it goes from seven to fourteen, right, or fifteen. Um, but parents aren't letting their kids go there to cross, so you're not going to capture them because they've been trained not to go there. But there still are times where the crossings are taking place. So. On one side of Hearst Drive, you have a, an elementary public school. On the other side, you have an elementary Catholic school over um, on Ashford beside Young Street. Uh, you also have the senior school, like the St. Peter's um, Secondary School there. And so there's actually traffic going, child traffic going in both directions. There's also um, school bus pickups right on Hearst on only on one side of the road. So I'll give you an example. I lived on Bruce Crescent, which is opposite, right beside the store, and I would have to go away from a crossing to the corner of Bruce and Hurst, which is near the store, to get picked up on the far side of the street. And I, at that point, I've got a choice to go down to Cox Mill or a choice to go up to Golden Meadow Road, and I guess we can all guess that I jaywalked, right? Um, and this isn't like the Hearst Drive that I grew up skateboarding on and, you know, the city would have to send somebody to sandblast sidewalks and stuff. Um, it, it, it is now a thoroughfare. And so, you know, I'm looking at this going like, we want to create bike paths around the city. We want to do this, that, and the other to encourage pedestrian, this, you know, new trails. There's actually... Places like this, this isn't the only one, by the way. It's just one that I'm very passionate about that um, our CAO and others turned down uh, 15 years ago when I asked for it. Yeah, it was you. Um, we, we got the one with the hydro company up at the top of Hearst. We didn't get that one. Um, but, but it's, to me, like, I have to be consistent with where I stood 15 years ago. Um, and that was uh, somebody who saw it every single day and who, you know who's driving home there every day. Um, I, I, it's only gotten worse in the sense that the amount of traffic and the schools have expanded and there's more portables. It just, to me, seems like it doesn't matter what we do there. Uh, there is a, a major liability and we're not going to capture, we're not going to capture what is actually needed there. Um, I say that and I just want to remind all members of council of this. You know, there's been a culture here on this table that used to be like, oh, if you're bringing something forward for like a, a ward council, a, a ward thing, it's, it needs to go to the back of the line. And, you know, I hope we breed a culture on this table when you see an emergency situation, if staff can't figure it out because they're living within the boxes, right, that we give them, <laughs> okay. Uh, that we find a way to make it happen. So if it's not an intersection pedestrian signal here, maybe it's a raised intersection. Uh, maybe it's uh, the speed humps. Maybe it's putting trees in the center of the road, although that would make it really difficult to turn left on Manor Gate. Uh, <laughs> a note of the trees from the ward council. So the point is, something's got to be done here. Like, if it's not an intersection pedestrian signal, then tell me what, but it, it, does, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for pedestrian traffic. It doesn't work for road safety. Um, so... I'm not sure I can support it as the amendment to the amendment um, because I'm not, I, I'm, I'm certain that it's not going to come back with the warrants. So not living on the street or representing it, but everything you've just said. So you're believing that the staff are not going to see the numbers, but for the speed of traffic that's increased. So I'll withdraw my amendment to the amendment. Because if we can't capture, I don't want to waste time with city staff and stuff because if it's that sporadic. But the school on one side is high school? Sorry. There's an elementary Catholic and an elementary public. Right. And then there is a seat, there's a secondary Catholic. Right. Um, and, yeah, you're right. We're less concerned about the 14 to 17 and more concerned about the 10-year-olds you know, yeah. or whatever. But So just a question maybe through you to staff. Do we have any report of anybody being struck there? 
No, you guys keep track of like traffic collisions and stuff like that. Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to uh, the Deputy Mayor. I'd have to look that up. We do have stats, um, certainly, across the city, but we'd have to look at that up specifically. Okay. So, like I said, you know, I know you represented the area and then Councillor Hamilton now, um, knowing that it's, you know, lots of complaints and stuff like that. Um, so I, I don't think that I, I need to use staff time on weekends and evenings if, if you don't think it's going to be that, you know, like you can't pinpoint a time of which is going to achieve the numbers. I, I, yeah, I'm not into wasting staff's time. But uh, for tonight, I'll support it. I'll wait for a little bit of information. But uh, the amendment, um, because it's proposed for a 2025 budget, it's not to go ahead and install it. But for a lot of the reasons that you had mentioned, we actually might be creating the liability if it's that fast by putting a pedestrian crosswalk and not a signalized intersection. So if there's never been an incident or a near miss or, you know, we might be creating the, because an underutilized crosswalk is the most dangerous thing you can put on the road. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, we're now back, just to, before we keep going, so we're now back on Councillor Hamilton's motion. Deputy Mayor Thompson's going to get more information in the next week. And I'm going to go, before I go to Councillor Harvey, I'm going to go to Councillor Corser, then Councillor Harvey. And is there anyone else? And then Councillor Kungle. And then Councillor Ngusi. Over to you. Um, Mayor Nettle, I absolutely appreciate and I, I, I support what you said about um, the problems with measuring um, pedestrian traffic when pedestrian traffic is not there because it's not safe. And it, we want to encourage um, active transportation and pedestrian traffic as much as possible. And so if, it, like you said, if we're not going to see a higher amount of numbers because parents aren't going to let their kids cross the road, then it is an issue. Um, my question was is, is for, I guess, uh, just from clarity from staff, I guess, through you to Ms. Banfield, um, what, for, for what the ask is for this uh, crossing, is this a like a, a street lights crosswalk like you see in front of Hillcrest, I guess, as an example, where you push the button and the light turns red and then you can cross the road? Or is it a actual hangover crosswalk where you have the yellow with the light flashing? Like what, what is, what would this, this look like? Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Corser. So in the staff report um, in Appendix C, it does actually show the detail of the crosswalk um, that uh, is being proposed um, on the Mapleton Avenue site. Um, the way that the motion is um, is worded for staff would, would basically take it away and would, would take a look at what would the best the best type of crosswalk that would be used in this scenario uh, and, and bring it back uh, in the 2025 budget deliberations. So I can't right at the spot tell you exactly what uh, the crosswalk might look like at Hearst because staff didn't rec necessarily recommend that we put a crosswalk there. So we'd have to take a look at what crosswalk scenario would be best in this location. I only ask specific because uh, on my way to see the totality on, on Monday, I was driving through um, uh, St. Catharines uh, at uh, school uh, about 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, there was a lot of pedestrians out, as you can imagine, and there was a crosswalk that had the strobes that I don't see in Barrie. And I might be going off the beaten path on this, and I'm just wondering if that is something that would be, to um, Deputy Mayor's point, uh, be a more um, in-your-face-ish to, uh, the, uh, I'm sure you, um, I, I don't know if you're referring to, know what I'm referring to about the crosswalks with the actual yellow strobes um, that I've, I've seen used in different municipalities, but I haven't seen used here. And would that be um, uh, on the table for consideration for these type of crosswalks? Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to Councillor Corso, I'd prefer to just look into that a little bit and give you some answers because there are certainly different crosswalks can be painted white lines or, you know, can have lots of bells and whistles, as you've described, and each have a different application based on road widths and, and 
road speeds and, and those sorts of things. So it's quite technical and um, I'd rather get you the proper information than just um, answer this evening. <laughs> you don't have that off the top of your head? No, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Nuttall. Um, I will definitely support this. It's aligned with one of our priorities, which is community safety. When I look at the topographical side of it, you're dealing with an area that's almost 400 meters away from the closest intersection, so you know people are not walking 400 meters to get up to the intersection at, Co at Cox Mill. They're doing exactly what you did as a kid. You were jaywalking. Um, <laughs> And this very much reminds me of Marcellus Drive in my ward, where I actually have two of these full signalized crosswalks between Mapleton and Mapleview. Uh, the first one, ironically, is exactly this scenario where there's a plaza right at the corner of Mapleton and Marcellus, and just a little bit south of the plaza, away from where the, the three-way stop is, one of these signalized intersections are, are in place for that exact reason. Um, and actually, the layout of the road's identical. One lane each direction with, uh, with, bike, with the uh, multi-purpose uh, bike lanes on either side. Um, and then a second one was added further south when uh, MP Broussard was the councillor um, to assist the kids in crossing um, that were coming from WC Little. So, like, I mean, this is totally aligned with what's going on and uh, happened in my ward several years ago before my time. So I... Uh, would have difficulty not supporting it and uh, especially too when it's aligned with uh, one of our strategic priorities and I'll be quite honest with you I don't need to wait for somebody to get hit to know that this is a good idea so those are my comments and definitely support you with this Councillor Kungle I have you next and then I've got Councillor Hamilton uh, thank you Mary Nettle so I'll support it I mean it always gives pause when it's not recommended and I think two out of the four metrics aren't met, so the context is important to the conversation. Um, but I guess, you know, f when we get into budget deliberations and potentially lose sight of some of the context of conversation between now and then, uh, I guess I would just say, if we want to incentivize people actually using safe routes and seeing more uh, use, and this is, if I'm hearing you, Mayor Nuttall, this is not the only one, that at what point in time do we actually just... Um, look at our processes to consider what else is out there. So is there a comprehensive review across the city to say, where do we actually need to incentivize safe passage? Where are there gaps? And unless one of us is coming forward and advocating, you're going to see the benefit. But otherwise, we inherently will just be supporting areas where there's particular knowledge based on something or it's been raised as a concern or it's been identified. But I, but I think it's to say, if, if, if we're willing to commit potentially deliberating on money for this, Let's take a comprehensive approach across the city. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Councillor Kungle, and I think we started that. I believe, Councillor Corsair, we asked for... Yeah. Yeah. So you don't even have to tell them. We, we agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I think we asked for a report back on unsignaled uh, crosswalks. Uh, St. John Vianney, Sunnydale, I know there's, they're around. Um, which is not exactly the same, but it's one portion of what you're asking for, Councillor Kungle. So, do we have a timing uh, on that? I, I don't know off the top of my head for sure. Yeah. So then I'll leave it as a comment to say it would be really important to have a timing on that well in advance of the 2025 deliberations on this investment, so we can actually look at an approach that might serve an intention, which is overall making improvements to support active transportation. Uh, agreed. And just on your on your comments on the the budgeting, um, you know, Councillor uh, Hamilton and I had a late conversation about um, it being added to the budget versus actually a, a, a for consideration of the budget for exactly that reason, uh, in the sense that we want to make sure that it's falling in the priorities. And um, I, I could be wrong, but I think that the dollars that are coming in from the um, Madam Clerk from uh, the photo speed cameras, <laughs> thank you, Deputy Mayor, I can't think, um, are being reinvested back into road safety in one manner or another. Is that only through the radar system, or is it overall for road safety? Through you, Mayor Nuttall, to members of council, um, the motion 
talked about road safety measures. So this this may be something that qualifies, but to your point, you know, if people keep going 60 in a school zone, we might have enough dollars to do a lot more places. Or, or 50, I, 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 I'm not going into 52, uh, but, but, you know, why don't you put an item together asking for a list? Like, that, that is probably the best thing. I'm not sure attaching it to this is the best thing right now, uh, because it was a report back on two specific studies. So if I may, I don't disagree, but I'm counting that into the context of me supporting that, even if I was going to challenge it in the budget would be, it, let's not do the, the one-offs and just stop the conversation there. So then I'm going to look for, I'll support the amendment, but I'm going to look for clarity to say, if it's already been actioned, is it sitting then it's coming back to a particular table and that committee, is it infrastructure otherwise, needs to just revisit that with a timeline? It was community safety uh, okay. where we asked for specific information from staff on unsignaled in intersections. I think what you're talking about is something more comprehensive in the sense that, and, and you know, I think what you're actually challenging council with is, do you have these types of situations that exist where there's been either current or historic reports done um, that don't necessarily support uh, the criteria that we've identified um, as needing to be to be met? Uh, but we do know that there's major issues in that mm -hmm. in that area. And like Sunnydale Park is just perfect one for Council Course, or it's, it's easy to say and easy to see. Mm -hmm. um, so I would actually look maybe for a more comprehensive item for discussion. To, At community come, safety. Like to come from you and it would, yes, eventually go to community safety. Okay. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Just one last comment and thank you and through you and I appreciate the conversation and dialogue. It's great. I think uh, Councillor Cursor, what you just raised is, is, you know, a very good point and approach that we should consider looking at. I don't want to approach these as one-offs. I'm simply approaching this because I hear it over and over and over again and it is a concern. I don't want to wait for an accident to happen. I see, I've seen personally near misses a number of times. Like it's, it's, it's not uncommon. But I did just want to clarify one point you made that it only met um, two of the four metrics. And I would just clarify that, that there's actually an A and a B. And A is the eight hour pedestrian volume and with vehicle volume over 750 vehicles. So it met half of that. Uh, and B was actually that the site's located greater than 200 meters, which it is, or there are requirements for connectivity. So that was a, a, an or. So it's not actually four, it was two when we meet one and a half of the two. So just wanted to clarify that for you. Um, anyway, appreciate the support and I think that's all I'll say on this item. Any other questions or comments on this? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment? The amendment passes, uh, the main motion is amended. Are there any com comments or questions on it? Uh, Councillor Ngusi. Thank you, Mayor Nadal. I just wanna say thank you to our dedicated staff, uh, especially Ms. Ms. Banfield and uh, her team their dedication regarding addressing the high-speed traffic in our area, uh, Ward 6, specifically on uh, Mapleton Avenue, uh, has been truly commendable. So uh, we have had so many email and phone calls back and forth, and uh, I just want to say thank you for the good work. appreciate it. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I said this by email today. Um, or maybe it was yesterday, thank you for the work that's being done to the traffic department on getting things out into the community. I know it's not specific on these two items, but uh, it's much quicker than it I ever remember, and uh, that does create safer situations within each of these wards. So while I don't get to point any of these things in any direction on behalf of council, please pass that on, Ms. Banfield, to you and your team, uh, because it's a, it's a marked improvement. It's a really, really, really good thing. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Approved. Uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson, I believe uh, we're at inquiries. Do you have any, sir? There's none there. Any other inquiries around the table? Seeing none, announcements, sir. Do you have any inquiries? Or any announcements, Deputy Mayor? I have none. Any other announcements around the table? Councillor Kungle. Just a quick one, because I think uh, it's already there uh, with a lot of information, but because of the timelines, just a reminder, 
I think it's April the 19th is the survey that's out there publicly around feedback on the Bayfield transportation uh, changes to the lanes. So, I mean, that's impacting things from Gross Street up towards Cundall. So, in particular, that huge artery that is a high traffic area. So, um, I thought the survey was great. I know it's one of maybe three or more different elements tied to that. But we have had questions at calls around the changes to the Bayfield uh, corridor by that 400 overpass in the timeline. So thanks for posting the information. Please do, uh, if you've got an opinion about that, uh, look to fill that out for staff on the city's website by April the 19th. Thank you, Councillor. Any other announcements around the table? I'm seeing none. Uh, just a reminder that the, as we saw in the presentation tonight, the new waste collection contract on May 1st, uh, eligible business institutions must register to receive the current level of curbside water collection uh, services by April 15th to avoid interruption in collection. For more information, please visit barrier.ca slash curbside collection changes. Registration is now open for the city's spring into clean cleanup program. Uh, the registration closes on April 11th. Uh, please make sure if you want to participate that you uh, get your information in there and come and help out. It's a great day to help clean up the city uh, after the, I guess, the melt, uh, the, the small melt we had this year. Uh, the City of Barrie, in collaboration with various local partners, has planned community job fairs events for the months of April and May. The next community job fair is taking place at South Shore Centre on the 17th of April from 1 to 5. We'll now move on to the circulation list. Are there any items on the circulation list from March the 27th? I'm seeing none. How about April the 3rd? April the 10th? Seeing none, I am going to consider this meeting adjourned at 9.44 p.m.